Bom dia a todos. Vamos então iniciar este, este Porto Autoimmune Meeting Média Interna. Uh, já há uns anos que estamos nisto. Há para aí uma, uma opening cerimónia, portanto eu vou direto ao assunto. Eu agradeço a todas as pessoas que, 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 que foram convidadas. Quem é esta idiota que está a falar? Hã? Não, eu não me esmerei assim tanto. Mas quem é que pode dizer aqui? Eu... Ei, hey. oh, oh. Um, dois, três. Ok. I think it's time to start this first session of the meeting. Uh, the spectrum of the diseases of the immune system. So it's a lot to talk about. And I will start by introducing our first speaker, Professor Carlos Vasconcelos. Um, I can only So I'll keep it short. Uh, our first speaker is Carlos Vasconcelos. Um, I think the best thing I can say about him is that he's one of the most enthusiastic people I ever met about immunology, about science, and I guess also about life. So um, Carlos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Manel. Uh, uh, we have to live with enthusiasm. If not, why are we, why are we living? So I want to, to also, in first place, to thank Antonio Coutinho, the next speaker. He is the, the responsible for myself and a lot of us to be in love all these years. Uh, about immunology. Thank you so much, Antonio, for coming. So, 
Well, when I first ouvir a mim próprio, etc., etc., first time I put myself giving a talk about this issue, I always think about my last talk as I have. <laughs> I I tell you my last decades about immunology. Anyway, I try just to stop. Okay. Well, we have a nice time. Well, that's him for In the beginning is the clinical view. The diagnosis. In the end, is the clinical view already. Uh, again, the final result of clinical care. Is it alive? Is it cured? So on. In between and around, uh, we have the questions and the research. That this part is the part that even nowadays is still missing uh, in the clinical practice. And that is very important. I would speak, uh, keep speaking, but I need to show you the last slide. Uh, the last slide, I, I, I took yesterday a photo from my first uh, curriculum in 87. Uh, and uh, and it, it, it was about a, an experience I lived uh, here in immunology department, the first immunology department in the country, founded by Dr. Eugene Portugal. And I was working there uh, before I start my residency in internal medicine. And, uh, and uh, it, it's regarding a patient. Let's beg your pardon. Anyway, uh, yesterday, the food was not working. Of vaccination. And in in eighty 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 two no 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 in in eighty in eighty eighty one eighty eighty one I, I I went my first time uh, first time to the meetings of the Immunology Portuguese Society and there uh, I, I I I start uh, listening and studying protein. Very interesting and provoking things uh, he used to say. Uh, and uh, uh, the most provoking was in the internal medicine meetings, where he almost punished us, uh, telling that. Uh, that uh, we are treating autoimmune diseases 
uh, like uh, like uh, police repressing and we should by the, on the contrary we should stimulate and, and that idea nowadays we we can see that uh, that uh, uh, we can do it in practice in clinical practice almost Acho que podem ter ter invocado meu carro. Alguém deve ter invocado meu carro. Não, mas eu, eu, eu detecto automaticamente. Ele está ali. Ok. Ele vai se nos ver. Vê aí, vamos ver. Era muito arriscado. Just <laughs> Thank you. 
Remiram me estas luzes aqui, por favor. Remiram me estas luzes aqui, por favor. Estas luzes. Diminuir ou apagar. Salve. Mas diga ele que eu estou a continuar a ouvir aqui a história do eco. Deixa eu ter a mim. Ok. So, this in, in, in 80. In 81 or 82, this is a, a man, 73, and you see the monoclonal protein, and uh, it is an IgM K, -K uh, and um, we treat it with melphalan and prednisone, I think. And you see that the M comp component and even viscosity uh, fall down, but when we measure, I think by immunodiffusion, the uh, IgM is increasing. So I asked, I was a resident, I asked, why, why is it happening? And then uh, I did my, I mount uh, a technique to uh, cross the immunoletophoresis, and it showed the, clearly uh, by two different ways that uh, there were, um, there is an IgM, but there are also uh, several new chains, heavy new chains, uh, split by the, the immunosuppression, split uh, the pentamer. And so this is an explanation. And for me, it was a, a way to, to see uh, that we must think, well, Immune system. I hear the heart, the heart and lungs. I feel the liver, the muscles. I see skin, the eyes. I think so. The brain have to be. I fall in love. So there is another person. Hopefully. And how do I know the immune system exists? Where am I? What the hell am I doing here? Uh, and um, Antonio Putin said that. Don't say. Uh, if you put in two plates, brain and lymphocytes have the same, uh, same uh, weight, and same importance. Uh, and uh, we, did, during all these years, we, we knew a lot of the, the, the components of the immune system, and it was art. I must say, for a clinician to, to study all these components, uh, which we don't know exactly what, uh, what is. Uh, how it works and so on. But, uh, but uh, we knew during all these years that the immune system is everywhere, even in those organs uh, not so good smell. And uh, we understood that uh, inflammation is in the center of everything. So somebody used to say, everything is infectious until, sorry, everything is autoimmune until proven the contrary. Then they start saying everything is infectious, infectious uh, until proven the contrary. And uh, now we say everything is inflammation, you can be sure. And I always remember this phrase from Hermes, as above, so below, as within, so without, as the universe, so the soul, we will not move to this philosophic uh, field. But I, I like to, to understand that uh, the, the external universe has a parallel inside of us. And uh, I tried some, sometimes to see to, to understand, try to understand how many autoantigens we have inside of us. <sighs> well, we know about genes, we know about unique antibodies, but how many autoantigens? I don't think so. And uh, we knew from history that uh, in, in the plague, during the plague of Athens, uh, those, those that uh, recovered show uh, resistance to the disease. 
we know about this king that took small doses of poisons to protect himself against fatal poison later. We know of the story of the, the, the smallpox with generous. Uh, we know about anaphylaxis. We know about serum sickness. Uh, but the, 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 the way we really understand the existence of the, the existence of the immune system is about the infection. Uh, we know that persons with uh, repeat inf infection should have a weak immune system, immune deficiency, uh, but the infection is not really a disease of the immune systems. But the final result can be. Uh, you know that there are a spectrum of immune response to a microbe from death to, to cure, and death is related with microvirulence, weakness of the immune system, too much of the re reactivity of the immune system. Uh, and I think this is not a disease of the immune system. This is the result of too much inflammation. So we understood after all a lot of years and the Americans much more later, we understood that uh, uh, there is a physiological autoimmunity uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, which is different from the pathological uh, autoimmunity. So we understood that um, uh, progressively that we have allergic diseases, auto-inflammatory symptoms, immunodeficiency, autoimmune diseases, and this is uh, sometimes related to uh, the deficit of the, the immune system components, uh, other. The others, uh, but this relation dysfunction uh, um, was clear also that it is a problem. So it was simple if things were like that, uh, but it's not. Uh, uh, we, we can find quantitative effects, qualitative effects, uh, and we understand that uh, there is a loss of control mechanism because um, uh, uh, we have a lot of diseases. Uh, and uh, and uh, things return to normal. Uh, I'm sure, if I'm not crazy, that we have a lot of auto-reactive uh, reactions every day inside of us, and things get back to phases. So the problem are the, the control mechanisms, the dysregulation of this. And so this is a world, three worlds that are very well interconnected and micro on us, in us and around us have a lot of importance uh, on in all of this. We, we have a lot of uh, ways to study genes. Uh, this is a panel with more than 200 genes, uh, but uh, these studies only could help you in monogenetic, uh, monogenic um, synonyms, not in the majority, which are polygenics. So in clinical practice, we have these diseases. In the emergency room, if you have the, the pneumonia, the, the accidents, but then you have in your clinical practice, all these chronic diseases um, from diabetes to to cardiac, the surface, COPD, and here the autoimmune immunosis and autoinflammatories. Immunodeficiencies, um, one to 10,000, uh, the incidence, and uh, we knew that from Colonel Broughton in 52, uh, when he noted the absence of immunoglobulins in a boy with a history of pneumonia and repeated infections. And they start also the immunotherapy. IgG, and uh, and uh, so I jumped to recent uh, uh, this this phrase from uh, Leonard Calabres from Cleveland Foundation uh, when he, he say that now we see them as autoimmune disease, inflammatory disease, allergic disease, and the spectrum continues to enlarge. Indeed. And you you see the it's probably the last. Uh, last classification or almost last, and you see that included is, are the diseases of immune dysregulation and the auto-inflammatory disorders. 
So autoimmunity and immune deficiency represented uh, a phenomenon that uh, reflects inadequate immune function. Uh, autoimmunity in, in primary immunodeficiency may be caused by different mechanisms, including defects of tolerance uh, to self antigens and persistent stimulation, uh, which also, by the way, uh, happens in, in a, another immunodeficiency, but related to HIV. So there is an exaggerated chronic inflammatory response that is responsible for this, this regulation. Of course, much more import, important uh, secondary immunodeficiencies are much more common uh, and uh, related to all these diseases. And uh, uh, there, are, there is an accumulation of defects, uh, usually are heterogeneous and are very much difficult to measure in the laboratory. Autoimmune diseases, five to 10%. Thyroid and diabetes uh, are the most common, a lot more than 100 probably. The first description of autoimmune disease was in 1904. Uh, the cold paroxystic hemoglobinuria, and then the Combs and hemolytic anemia, and then the valerose uh, in patients with uh, arthritis. Uh, and uh, the L lupus, uh, LAS, uh, lupus cells described in 48. And uh, this man, which unfortunately uh, died last year, Noah Rose, and uh, which I have the pleasure to, 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 to know personally, he, he, he was a student of Vitebsky. And Vitebsky was a student of Paul Ehrlich, of autopsy. And uh, so Vitebsky. Uh, ran to America, Noel Rose student uh, with him, and, and uh, Noel Rose showed that the presence of autoantibodies against thyroid uh, and um, uh, in patients with chronic thyroiditis. But Vitevsky forbidden him to publish the paper, so he was uh, sure about the, uh, the absence uh, of the aurora or autotoxics. Uh, then he published, and, and Noel Rose was uh, uh, an important man in immunology, specifically uh, in the center of the world, let's say, John Hopkins Hospital. Well, and in 2000, we have IG, a gene hypothesis. Bach, and I, I, well, the reference was gone. This is a paper from 21, I think. Uh, I didn't uh, knew it. Um, and he says very well that the immune system is under constant control by immunoregulation and the, the influence of the environment. It sheds light on mechanisms underlying many immune related diseases and opens new perspectives uh, about this disease and, uh, uh, on the contrary, how the immune system protects us. And the Americans. Lately, they understood and they published this. Uh, well, I used to correct this. It's not benign autoimmunity. It's immunity and physiological uh, autoimmunity. And we also know that from genetic to environmental, uh, you can have nature versus, versus nurture. And we know also this year, uh, increasing field of epigenetics. Um, a lot of different factors, uh, one organ, more than one, uh, it corresponds to a precise puzzle. Uh, and uh, and for a method for clinicians, disease don't care about the appointment date. <laughs> the patient is stage, doctor is uh, the spectator, uh, time is the big lord in medicine. Uh, things happen when they have to. So there are many roads to reach pathological autoimmunity. We talk, uh, you, you know, uh, a lot of this. So this can explain the heterogeneity we see in autoimmunity. Organ systemic, organ is, uh, uh, any organ can be uh, attacked by the immune system. Uh, we know that uh, the, the incidence, as I said, diabetes, thyroid, uh, and the, the, the systemic, uh, the most common systemic is rheumatoid arthritis. 
and we know also that the, the symptoms are shared by different autoimmune diseases. So if you want to, to, to make a diagnosis based on, on the, the clinical findings, uh, you have to, to have many experience to, to, to give the, the, uh, the, the right value to each sign uh, and to see the, the puzzle. Well, this is an example, the classical example of loops, and you see a lot of uh, endotypes, let's say, of lupus. Um, and you know also that inflammation uh, and uh, uh, thrombosis, uh, it is a, a network. And uh, from the, the most uh, thrombotic uh, autoimmune disease, antiphospholipid, to the most inflammatory primary sugar, this is, uh, in fact, spectrum and there are a clinical lab. So by our side you have the time from first symptom to full-blown clinical picture, picture the clinical pre presentation, acute versus insidious, the severity, the pattern of clinical evolution, the type of and poor to antibodies. And, and that led us wide right presence of what antibodies are not more linked to development and severity of the aid. What is that telling us? Is telling that that well, except the vasculitis, anchor, and it's few some patients don't T double stand DNA. No more. This is occurs to me that uh, we should measure um, uh, frequently the levels of different points. And it is an ongoing story. You know very well this. This, this graphic till here and this one I, I, in this, uh, I put there because the story when I, we diagnose this do not, do not um, stop. And, uh, and the, the big question not answered is what is happening to, to this lupus appears with an nephritis or, or a brain? We don't know. We don't know. Uh, is it new? Uh, new immune reactions, new uh, interaction between the immune system and uh, the environment, or is, is it uh, uh, this time? Less than to, to have that evolution. We don't know. We still don't know. I don't know. Sorry. So now we are asking which pathways are involved in this disease? Is there or, or not a stability of the immunological patterns? And we are asking this because we have means, therapeutic means to, to act. So this is a fantastic time. Yes, we keep, we keep asking about etiology and about the existence of God or not. So immunopathology may change during this evolution and we, can, we should try accordingly. And we have still burning questions. The beginning in lupus are the 50 prone gene, genes are not are enough. Um, is it possible to define subgroups according to genes? Yes, uh, hormones and so on. Uh, what can we do to, for prevent lupus besides common sense? Yes, you monitor and treat clinical severity, but are you aware of EULAR quality measures adherence? It's very important to see if we are working well with our patients. How and when can we evaluate and monitor immunopathways and treat accordingly? We are leaving that. Uh, this is time. And how to put in clinical practice, uh, clinical and immunologic, immunological treat to target uh, strategy. Not easy. It's easy to say, not easy to do. And in the end, how to recognize the sustained end of activity if it exists. So many questions still without answer. You see the ITP. Uh, we don't know what determines the platelet set point. In this patient, this is 50,000. Okay, we are happy. In the other one, is less than 10,000 and can die. Some have that with this. Uh, is it too many autoantibodies, less fuel for the platelets or and we know also that uh, some diseases are more uh, related to CD4, some more for B. So 
uh, as a clinicians, uh, we have, we know this puzzle and we have to think about the, all these variables and, uh, and uh, so we need to have high quality phenotype data is absolutely essential to, 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 relation, to our relation with research. Autoinflammatory symptoms, this, this is the incidence, somebody call it innate autoimmunity. Uh, the first uh, time that this word appear was in uh, uh, 1999 by Dan Kastner. And by the way, Dan Kastner should should have uh, would he will speak he would speak uh, after this talk but uh, uh, he will speak tomorrow at six I know it's late but please uh, he is helping opening our mind so please uh, keep here to to hear man so characterized by Recurrent, uh, recurrent episodes of inflammation due, due to the innate immunity dysregulation because of gene mutations. Uh, this, they are distinct from autoimmune diseases, not only because uh, they, have, uh, they don't have autoimmune bodies, but they share phenotypical similarities. Uh, so inflammation is the center. Inflammation uh, recognizes foreign molecules or cellular associated damage. Uh, and indeed, there are mechanisms for down regulation. Uh, it's constituted by a, a cytoplasmatic complex uh, to recognize, and then an effector system, uh, which led to the, the, the synthesis of IL-1 and all these uh, side effects. FMF is the most known. We already have uh, know the gene. There are a lot. Uh, of other diseases, uh, many others. Uh, this is the, the classification of auto inflammatory synthesis, is a process in construction. We are living it today. So, many other diseases like atherosclerosis, diabetes, and so on, uh, uh, share similarities with these diseases. The clinical signs fevers, rash, joint and muscle pain, cirrhosis abdominal pain, CNS, and systemic inflammation. It's like the autoimmune diseases and immunodeficiencies. Fever here is periodic, alternating between fever attacks and fever-free episodes. And importantly, uh, autoinflammatory diseases are not associated with a progressive deterioration of uh, the patients, contrary to other diseases. And this is other two, or data two. Uh, a deficiency of this uh, uh, of other two uh, caused by mutations in, in the gene. And the question for me, uh, the clinical you can see from skin, neurological, gastrointestinal, nephrological, muscle, skeletal, immunological, lymph proliferation, and the, the these we have to remember, livedo reticularis, and uh, clinical pictures like polyarthritis nodosa uh, and um, ischemic and, your, uh, uh, and or hemorrhagic stroke. So in my nightmare, I remember some patients that I called, for instance, pan polyarthritis, and, and for sure, much probably, uh, uh, it was added to the feces. So we are living this today. And uh, this beautiful cartoon uh, showing the, the spectrum from immunodeficiency, uh, autoinflammation, autoimmunity, from the, the chronic uh, granomatosis disease to the rarely monogenic autoinflammatory disease like FMF, to the rare monogenic uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, the immunodeficiency like IPEX uh, and so on, the polygenic until the, the immunodeficiency where common variable immunodeficiency is of course the most important. I remember, you know this case, but for me they are uh, an old mark because I, I live uh, these situations. It's a, 
loopingers, it's a, a good loop. And you say, and he, he entered the, 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 the emergency room uh, with a cryptococcal meningitis, and he had a, a CD4 lymphopenia that was sustained after the infectious episode. So much probably this is an idiopathic lymphopenia. And this, another very good lupus with an APS, um, uh, rash, described lupus, uh, DBT, uh, the epiphenous thrombosis, and then uh, also the daughter deposits that complement, and she developed mental confusion, visual disturbance, and attacks in amnesia. The brain MRI showed those white things, white T2 hyperintensities, and the brain biopsy was positive for JC virus, and also an idiopathic less than 200 uh, CD4. So it seems it's a autoimmune diseases, it's an immune deficiency. So treating, some words about therapeutics, immunodeficiencies, you know, it's IVIG, rituximab for some autoimmune manifestation like ITP, transplant, of course, auto-inflammatory scenes, colchicine is the main uh, standard therapeutic, but patients not responding can have anti, anti IL1, TNF, IL6, and uh, genus uh, inhibitor, jack inhibitors. Autoimmune diseases. <laughs> this is a, a question in the net I, I, I read. If I'm taking immunosuppressant biological therapy, do anybody know how much is the breast in my, my immune system? Try to answer. I don't know. Simple question, like children questions. So, Unfortunately, we cannot measure autoimmunemia. Uh, we try with C G C4, some some sometimes autoimmune Purex. We are not doing that. Immunocomplex. We are not doing that. And uh, we know that uh, from we not we cannot cure. We try to obtain complete remission, at least a clinical remission, partial remission. But we have patients with no response and with refractory disease. And with time, uh, this result, this clinical result, can change. So nothing is guaranteed when you see a patient that is is going uh, okay now. So this is the SLEULR treatment recommendations. You see a lot of from mild to severe, uh, a lot of immunosuppressors, and here it is the first biological approved. Uh, uh, for loops and the uh, off-label but on practice rituximab uh, B cells depletors. So that led us biologicals, and we are playing the sorcerer's apprentice for sure. So we have to be careful with this uh, because everything, who, the things we, we are born with. They are important. The, the, the very most beautiful example is the TNF in this beautiful Escher image. So we are treating all these years with repressing, controlling, as I, as I said, continue, was provoking us in our internal medicine the, the meetings. So we are depleting cells, the bad and good clones, and blocking molecules for, for the good and bad. And we are naive. We are trying to. to, to 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 train to uh, reach only the pathological, but we till nowadays we cannot separate the pathological from the, the physiological, the protecting. And uh, indeed, uh, when we deplete the viral lymphocytes and with infection, we may affect the repertoire composition and tolerance. So here is again the autoinflammatory treatment continuum, uh, and you see that you can use. Uh, in these diseases, uh, autoinflammatory and, and uh, out, between autoinflammatory and uh, autoimmunity, the anti cytokine, and here um, uh, the anti lymphocyte uh, depleting the biologicals. And now, this is the, the moment is to find uh, biologicals that can act uh, in the memory plasma, plasma cells. But again, we are acting not only in the pathogenic memory plasma cells. Well, stimulating, regulating. So you must stimulate the, 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 the good clones. You must stimulate the mechanism of the control mechanism. And low dose IL-2 therapy 
was very good. Oral IVIG good, but uh, expensive and transitory. Oral tolerance, bad results uh, in clinical trials, but uh, it works in mouse models. But when we do it in, in the rheumatoid arthritis patients or, or uh, multiple sclerosis, the patient already uh, became the disease uh, when we made diagnosis some years before. There are trials nowadays with nasal and the oral and TCD3 and uh, with peptide loaded telerogenic dendritic cells. I believe it is right. After all, this, how is it my clinical view about diseases of the immune system? We must keep those clinical phenotypes in the to find that the highest level. We must keep our eyes and mind open to what research is telling us. Meetings are very important. We have the enormous obligation for the sake of our patients to find ways and establish network with fundamental researchers. No excuse for working far away in the interior. Press the administration. We don't work in the emergency room if you don't have uh, a seratic for our patients. It still is a burning question. <laughs> and be happy to live these days. Never so many things have yet to be discovered. I want to thank my collaborators. collaborators. I'm retired almost for six years and I'm leaving and I'm not uh, so dementiated because I, I still work with them. Uh, I still uh, leave the, the fantastic discussion that Friday. They are crazy people, human, with their things, <laughs> but they are fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos, for this uh, comprehensive and beautifully presented account of the spectrum of autoimmune or of immune diseases and the clinical challenges that play ahead. I guess that we go straight to our next speaker, Antonio Putin. Good morning. It's my time to introduce Antonio Coutinho. But first of all, I want to thank you to both of you, Carlos, for this kind of invitation. Antonio Coutinho, I'm not introducing him because every, everybody knows Antonio Coutinho. So you can get in the net the curriculum of this, tremendous curriculum of this man. And uh, I worked with this man uh, some years ago. And two things I um, got from, from him, very important and maybe it could be a challenge for, for all of us. The first thing is he consume information, this man, tremendous consume information, but uh, with some guys that worthwhile to read. First step that he teach me. The second, Above all, he not consume only, he introduce new concepts, introduce knowledge for our community, scientific community. This is two characteristics of this man. Thank you, Antonio Coutin. Good morning. Um, thank you, Karen, for what you said. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> both Carlos. Thanks for the invitation to be here and thanks also very much for uh, calling me an immunologist. As you should know and many of you know, I am not an immunologist for the last 20-25 years or so. I stopped being a scientist in 98 uh, and I ceased to do research and to have a group um, because I assumed uh, other responsibilities and I'm not good enough to do two things at the same time. So either you do administration and teaching and, and so forth, uh, or you do science. Uh, uh, you know, science is too important to do something else in addition. So I, I stopped. 
but uh, I follow things. Uh, uh, I, I read and so as Carlos <laughs> said, um, uh, of course, one has more and more to select what one reads because there's so much more to read. So that's obvious. Uh, I learned this from my first mentor, Jörn Müller, uh, whom I uh, questioned about what should I read. And uh, <laughs> he opened a drawer, gave me an A4 paper with uh, some 10, 12 names and said, you should read every, everything these people publish. And I said, thank you very much. I was leaving the room and said, wait, wait. And another piece of A4, now full of names, at least 40 or so. And you should never read anything this guy's published, okay? So it, it is increasingly so. There are people, uh, you should read everything they publish, and some that uh, you have read enough, no, no more of what they say. Uh, so that's how I learned from Jörn Müller to select what I read. As, as Carlos says, one has to select. And of course, one has to think about what one is doing. And I, I, when Carlos uh, kindly invited me to come here, uh, the first thing I did was to recall that one of the last things I did as an immunologist was to write a little paper. Um, I was in a lupus congress and the organizer, uh, our late good friend, uh, Donato Alarcon Segovia, uh, asked me to write an appraisal of the research on lupus at that stage. And I thought that's a good thing to reread them now. And uh, uh, it was somewhat negative that there was no progress. Um, 25 years later, almost, <laughs> uh, I have to come to about the same conclusion. I don't need to come to that because Carlos Vasconcelos just did that. So where is the problem? Uh, and of course, it applies to autoimmunity in general. Of course, we know more facts than what we knew 25 years ago, but we don't understand more than what we did then. One of the greatest in the biology of the last 50 years or so, whom uh, we also lost a couple of years ago, uh, is one of my other mentors, Cindy Brenner. And he used to say, he said it in his novel speech, we are drowning in a sea of facts, starving for knowledge. And this is getting worse. Actually, a couple of weeks ago, Paul Nurse published uh, some kind of editorial in Nature uh, reminding us of what Sydney used to say and, and saying that uh, it is unbelievable that uh, increasingly so, journals don't like hypotheses in the papers. <laughs> so that it's getting worse because they are encouraging this sea of data and no understanding. And they forget one fundamental thing. What is the process of science? Is to propose hypotheses and test them experimentally against the reality. If there is no hypothesis, there is nothing to do. If there is no question, uh, all the three mentors I had, the, the third one was, was of course Niels Yerner, uh, all used to say the important thing is the question. The rest, as we say in Portuguese, is intendência. Somebody will do what, but the question has to be the right one. And it was my conviction at the time I wrote that little paper, it's only two pages, you can go and read it. It's worthwhile, I think, I'm sorry to do propaganda for my papers, but it's worthwhile, it's only two pages. But my explanation was that the problems were structural and structural in the sense that there was no comprehensive theory uh, that could be tested. We all knew in immunology that the progress of understanding the immune system started only after the late 50s, after Yerner's proposal for uh, a selective theory of antibody formation and the modification, as he himself called it, Burnett called in his colonial selection paper, a modification of the theory on uh, selective theories of antibody production. Until then, any observation in immunology was as important as anyone else, because there was no conceptual framework where to put the question and who, who, the, who 
that could determine the relevance of the questions we were asking. If we, do, if we don't have such conceptual frameworks, forget it. It's a bit like what is happening for a number of years now in neurosciences. We have, there are between half a million and one million neuroscientists in the world. There are now more than immunologists, actually. <laughs> uh, what do we know about theories of thinking? How do we think? No, they have all sorts of little models on networks and so on, and, and uh, uh, synaptic reinforcings and, and things, uh, and now back propagation and networks and so forth. But uh, there is no theory how we think. And many people think that's what we are really missing before any progress can be achieved. Because any observation in that con context without a framework, uh, how to think about it, any observation again is as important as anyone else. So if we think about it, going back to my little, <laughs> little paper <laughs> from 25 years ago, um, the problem was structural. We didn't have a comprehensive framework and the one we have was no good, was no good at that time. So I'm repeating myself again. <laughs> enough is enough. <laughs> no, but uh, uh, as, as Carlos said at that time, uh, we, myself and others were getting very convinced that there was a physiological autoreactivity and therefore natural tolerance uh, in health, uh, in physiology. We can throw it by the window. <laughs> uh, so uh, there was a physiological autoreactivity and therefore a tolerance and the physiology, uh, immune physio physiology should be a, to a, a term that we introduced then um, that, that, uh, that, that should be dominant, tolerance should be dominant. So with Avarmias and many others, we got convinced of this physiological autoreactivity and that was not in the frame of the dominant archetype to explain the immune system. It was not at all. That was, tolerance was based on, you heard about Vatevsky forbidding uh, Noel Rose. Uh, that's why, by the way, the first one to describe an autoimmune disease was Reut, not Noel Rose, because Vitebsky forbid him from publishing. So the, the, the frameworks were not just in addition, of course, this was, I wrote this little paper in the end of the 90s, yes. Uh, and uh, in, in the beginning of the 90s, uh, Sakaguchi came up with the, his original observations on regulatory T cells. Then in the mid 90s, Le Doirin and I and our colleagues uh, demonstrated how they were produced in the thymus and they worked in a dominant manner in the periphery. So it was clear that the old framework was no longer, uh, and the new framework should be of a physiological autoreactivity that was regulated, and the importance of this regulatory cells was central. So that was my view at the time. I was quite enthusiastic as that the future will be brilliant uh, until I wait 25 years to do the same exercise and I get depressed again. Um, for one reason, I think, and that's what I want to discuss a little bit with you. So the, the clinical observations went very much along that, um, in the fact that, as we heard from Carlos as well, that very often uh, autoimmune disease is associated with immunodeficiency, with lack of something, probably lack of some element of regulation. But again, this was not an easy notion to be accepted. I remember when, uh, uh, our colleague Magda Carnell Sampai in Sao Paulo and myself and others started saying this, nobody took that very seriously. It was already 15 years ago or something. So it, it is so that uh, new concepts are hard to make room because we are all used to thinking in a given way and we are not always ready to change our minds. My mentor, Joran Muller, used to tell me, if you are not able to change your opinion, all you'll ever learn is technique. 
Don't forget this. Of course, it's not to be um vira casacas, mas é. Think about it. And if, you are, if the, the evidence is good enough, the argument is good enough, you change your mind. So that's what science is all about, after all. But uh, coming back to the, to the clinical observations, those were very important to sort of uh, uh, support this view of dominant tolerance. Uh, more recently, there was one even probably more striking uh, about it that you all know about it probably better than I, and that is the so-called uh, immunotherapy-related adverse effects that one sees in cancer patients that are being treated with so-called uh, checkpoint inhibitors. Antibodies that are supposed to somehow unleash the immune system that is there to have him attacking the cancer. But of course, what the immune system does, because if we inhibit regulatory mechanisms, is to attack the individual. And uh, if you take all grades of the adverse effects, from the low grade to the high grades, to death, in some unfortunate cases, it's probably around 90% of all patients that undergo immunotherapy in cancer um, have adverse effects. And about depending on which antibody you use or antibody combination, in the combinations of anti-CTLA4 and the anti-PD1 or PD1 ligand, it's usually more than 50% of all the patients that do severe side effects, which are all autoimmune. Now, one could think that this should be a, a situation where medical doctors, immune, immunologist uh, prone medical doctors, and those that uh, give their lives to uh, study autoimmunity should go in and look at, at the situation. Here we have a situation where we are actually almost doing an experiment to induce autoimmunity. It actually works better than most of the experimental autoimmune systems in the uh, experimental animals. It works at least half of the times. So I think it's really a big shame that you are not working all on this. That you are not trying to understand what is going on with autoimmune disease from those, in quotes, poor patients, model systems. Now, the situation at the same time comes in favor of the old idea of dominant tolerance, because we are suppressing uh, the crucial components of regulation, and therefore you do autoimmune disease. So one more evidence in favor of dominant tolerance. On the other hand, if you go to the details of the situation, it doesn't support it at all for one reason, and we'll come to that in a minute. For example, it's clear that there is very good correlation in the thousands of cases that have been described so far and published. There is a very good correlation between the success of the anti-cancer response and how serious is the autoimmune reaction. That is the two things go together, which is something that uh, you know, we expected. I remember uh, 20 years ago again, uh, publishing a paper on cancer that, uh, that was called the, uh, the problem of uh, immune reactions to cancer is a problem of tolerance. And the moment you, 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 you make a response against, against cancer cells, of course, 99.9% .9 of all the cancer antigens, or rather of the antigens of the cancer cells are self antigens. So if you unleash something, of course, you'll get autoimmune reactions. So, Again, that, as I was saying, that goes in the same line and goes fine. Except that, for example, um, if you do immunotherapy for cancer in, in cancer patients that already have an autoimmune disease, there is not one case described of uh, worsening of the autoimmune condition. You always get new autoimmune manifestations, you don't get worse in the one that you already have. That's very strange, isn't it? 
another very strange thing that there are lots of, of course, we could think that there are many observations being published in many places. So until the dust settles, we don't know exactly, but there are already many things published, so you can have an idea. The other thing that's very confusing is that in some patients that get uh, an antibody, the anti checkpoint inhibitor antibody or a mixture of them, you, you see autoimmune manifestations from next few days. In some, you see it after a few weeks, in some, you have to wait for months until you see the first. There are even cases described them more than a year. How do we know? Oh, how do we explain this? No idea. Worse, probably, from my point of view, is the worst thing, is that uh, there's a, an interesting paper that uh, collects the prevalence of, auto, of various autoimmune diseases as they are typed by uh, the autoimmune doctors uh, in, in 200,000 or 220,000 cancer patients. And there's a given prevalence that is not very different from what we are used to. If you look at uh, immunotherapy related adverse effects, they have nothing to do with the prevalence of the autoimmune diseases in the cancer cohort. That is, if the old idea of dominant tolerance is correct, you would expect that the moment you release the system, you get more of the diseases that you are get, already getting. No, no. You get very different frequencies of other diseases. You get an extremely rare things like hypophysitis, that is rather frequent. You get autoimmune pancreatitis, that is very rare, usually. You get autoimmune hepatitis, that is also quite rare. You get of course, in great frequencies, you get uh, colitis, uh, you, get, uh, you get some uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lower than in the normal cases, but there is no coincidence between the prevalence of autoimmune diseases in the normal population or in the cancer population and the type of disease you get when you give checkpoint inhibitors. So something is wrong and we don't understand. And if I'm saying that we should study those patients to try to understand what is autoimmune disease and how it comes about to understand the thing, then I'm doubting that this would be the right thing to do in this case, because it doesn't fit with what we think. Now, it is good when we come to a situation where things don't fit, because it forces to rethink it over the whole thing, and to try to understand where are we wrong. Now, some of my colleagues that, with whom I discuss these things are a bit less pessimistic than I, and they are younger also, that's probably the reason. <laughs> but <laughs> they say, no, it's clear. In the dominant tolerance model, we never had a good theory or hypothesis for targeting in autoimmune diseases, which is true. There is no targeting hypothesis in any theory in immunology I know, which is very strange. Carlos just said, we have an autoimmune patient, sometimes uh, this guy destroys uh, the pancreas, the next one attacks the, and the, the joints, the other one attacks the kidney. We don't know why. Of course, there is this temptation to look for antigens that Carlos wants to count how many there are. Of course, we are immunologists, so we prefer to look at antibodies and T-cell receptors rather than to the antigens. The antigens, who cares? We, we want to understand the system, not the antigens. So uh, therefore, we must have a theory of targeting, of autoimmune targeting, before we say we have a comprehensive framework. That's what my younger colleagues say. So if this is true, we for years and years that some of us have been saying that. Uh, and because we don't have this theory, we cannot explain these findings that are apparently contradictory from the autoimmune manifestations in checkpoint inhibitor treated patients compared to normal autoimmune prevalence. 
It may be so. And as I said, in, in a way, it's a good thing because it encourages, <laughs> encourages to rethink the situation. Maybe some of you, I see there are rather many young people here in the audience. Uh, I don't expect new theories from people of my age. So it must be one of you younger people to come up with a good idea on the targeting of autoimmune manifestations because we don't have any, any theory, any hypothesis. And if you come up with one, we may solve this apparent contradiction and we may take full advantage of the clinical observations that are being collected in cancer and will be increasingly so for the next uh, 10, 20 years, that I have no doubt. So, in other words, I come back to Sidney Brenner's and to uh, try to insist in the point that we need conceptual frameworks to work, not just in science, but also in clinical medicine. Carlos insisted we need to do good diagnosis and to take conclusions for the therapy. Uh, I think these are two different cultures, scientists and doctors. I've been concerned with this for the last 20 years or so. Uh, you know, scientists are trained to ask questions. Doctors are trained to treat patients. It's not the same thing. I mean, uh, of course, the doctors ask questions about the patients, but the first thing they want to do is not that. Scientists, of course, are very happy if some of the things they do can be used to help patients, but they are not there for that. So the cultures are different and we need increasingly so people who put the two cultures together. We need to teach some lights of medicine to scientists and we are trying to do that. Uh, the fact that many uh, of the places that do good medic medical education to do today, do it on the basis of PBLs, problem-based learning, which anybody can learn, including scientists. So we are ongoing with that experience to, to give PBLs to scientists. Uh, and uh, the results have been dramatically favorable so far. But we also have to give some science to medical doctors. Uh, the medical degree in Portugal, in most places I know in detail, are not exemplary in the level of science education, to say the least. So we need that the two cultures interact more until they converge and they converge productively in some way. I, I'll finish soon, Carlos. I, I don't want to continue with this. But I, I, I just want to say that it is true <laughs> that with the two cultures, uh, uh, we, we have this difficulty, but it's also correct what Carol said, and I agree, that only by this convergence probably we'll be able to solve the problems that we need to solve, either as a clinical doctor trying to solve the problems of the patients, or as a scientist trying to define which are the relevant questions to ask. Because again, uh, without a conceptual framework, uh, we don't know which questions are relevant. And if you don't have relevant questions, the best thing is to ask no questions at all. Thank you. So it's open comments or questions, it's an opportunity. Raquel, go ahead. Thank you so much for both the presentations. Um, I really would like to still having this conversation with a glass of wine probably. And um, I do have some uh, questions, provocative ones, for both of you. Uh, some of them I already did them to Carlos Vasconcelos. Is if uh, if you have to hypothesize about the uh, central nervous system and the immunological 
system, if you can call it so, in a philosophical way, could you think that they are both interdependent and grow in parallel? Um, since the beginning of the development, uh, I'm trying to clarify a little bit more. What do you think, uh, all of you, about our way of thinking uh, transforms the immunological uh, system and the way it works and vice versa in an interdependent way? As Carlos said, uh, and we all know, there are people who are born without an immune system. As far as we know, they think the same way as normal people. Um, so, uh, as Mel Cohn used to say, to discuss these things of immunopsycho, neuroimmunology, and so forth, it's like to look for a black, a black cat in the middle of the night inside of a tunnel. I just want to say one more thing. Uh, philosophy has little to do with science. So when we hypothesize, we should never do it philosophically. Uh, hypothesize is construct testable hypotheses. If the hypotheses are not testable, forget them. It's not philosophy. Uh, although you, you live the uh, part of your life uh, discussing with people, discussing a lot of philosophy and metaphor. Metaphor, the, the... metaphor is not philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> metaphor is like oh. to say that aqui no Porto somos os melhores, caralho. No, 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 é philosophy. No, it's not philosophy. Um, I insist that it's good to do hypothetical constructions if they are testable. If they are not, forget it. Well, but uh, uh, we know that that patients with uh, with um, there are study with uh, old people comparing comparing uh, those who lived in their houses and those who lived in the, in the, in the lives. Okay, and uh, this one died uh, less survivor than the others. So we we feel that there is, and we know in loops patients those with the, the we know that the, the right there are, and all of that. Yes. Yeah, we know that. Uh, so, no, but, but I, I mean, the fact, made the fact that this? you are looking for a black cat in the middle of the tunnel in the night it doesn't avoid that sometimes you kick it. You, it's yeah. going to, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there is no, uh, you don't see possibility to to have research on this. Question. I mean, I don't see a serious testable hypothesis on that. If you produce one, I'll surrender. Okay. Okay. Next, next week. That's, I'll present that's it. it. Because it's very nice to say, oh, this is all connected yeah. and so blah, 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 but nothing concrete no that you can no look theory. at it. We, no we, I mean, science is that. We look at testable hypotheses, confronting, <laughs> confronting them with reality. If you can't do that, then it's philosophical. We have the reality, we don't have the tyrants, right? Other questions? Um, thank you both for your uh, horizon broadening uh, lectures. Uh, I think this is mostly for Professor Antonio Coutinho, but if anybody else wants to uh, chime in, uh, I'd be glad. Um, uh, you suggested PBL problem-based learning could help get scientists closer to uh, medical practice. So I'd ask you if you have any thoughts or suggestions on how we can uh, get medical doctors closer to science. Yes, we have done several experiments of that kind, either in a very structured way or in MD-PhD programs. And that works. I mean, medical doctors are uh, as competent, often more, than anybody else to do a PhD in science. So it's nothing against that. Now, if you don't want to stop for three or four years to do a PhD uh, and you want to continue medical practice, uh, 
then of course it has to be done in a different manner uh, and each institution should decide on how to do it what is clear is that uh, i know um, many many very good doctors that for example don't know why scientists study small flies for example they were never educated for that and and therefore they need to know more science more history of science and the process of science which is a different process from the medical process so it, it, it is really a question of educating, open, opening the minds for science, as the same way for the scientists in what concerns medical practice. Oh. Can I go first? Okay. I, I just wanted to uh, comment on this one because in the in the Netherlands we have these uh, programs where you first have a, a, a bachelor program from science and then you can continue with a master in medicine, which is actually uh, indicated to, to, to become a combination of researcher and medical uh, um, professional. So there are several options to, to steer this, but also in the regular curriculum for the medicine, we have uh, almost one year where we have uh, medical research and also more basic research possibilities. Very good. Uh, I think Holland has been a, an example for many others in Europe about it. Uh, there are now in Portugal two medical schools following the same, uh, you know, a graduate entry, like they say in the, in the US, which is a good thing, uh, particularly if it's PBL based and involves research from the baby day one and clinic yeah okay Laurent Arnaud from France um, I'm here um, for, for many years uh, we've done medicine based on strong clinical skills and I think it's still the same and for now maybe 10 or 15 years we've heard about uh, personalized treatment tailored therapy uh, but I must say in real life we are still using very basic techniques if you want to make a diagnosis of lupus you are going to use anti-nuclear antibodies, and this is not very recent. We are hoping for biomarkers, but we don't really have new biomarkers. So my, my question to you is really, are, are we ready for this uh, tailored medicine? Do you think we can introduce this in our clinical practice? Well, I do not want to retire absolutely from medicine without seeing that. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the team or part of our meeting is about tailored therapy. So we are making effort uh, on uh, this issue. And I remember that uh, almost five or six years ago, we, we had a, a meeting about T2T -t in autoimmune diseases, two full days. Uh, but uh, the truth is that you, you know better than myself uh, that uh, uh, even in, in lupus, to T is not uh, going. So, but now we have a lot of these monoclonal antibodies and these names and so on. So uh, I think we can go, but uh, we still don't know exactly what we are doing when we use, uh, we are blocking or, uh, and by the way, Antonio, uh, there's no, no problem. And by the way, Antonio, the, the, so, we have this beautiful thing of the uh, autoimmune disease related to inhibitors, uh, checkpoint inhibitors, but we still have an agonist of, of a checkpoint in, inhibitors, uh, Avatacept. Uh, uh, it's uh, like CTLA4. And the results, so do you believe that we must uh, research company, pharmaceutical companies should invest more uh, on agonists of this checkpoint uh, inhibitors, and that could be. I, I, you know, I'm sorry to say this, but um, I, 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 I often get a bit confused with the evidence that a particular antibody is agonist or antagonist for something, because particularly for cellular receptors, that have their internal ligands that in turn have other types of ligands. So 
very often, in my view at least, the evidence that some antibody we're injecting is an antagonist or an agonist of something uh, may be a simplification of the reality. And it depends mostly on the interest, on the financial interest of the company that sells it. So I'm not 100% sure of what's going on at that level. And I would suggest rather that each one of you that prescribes these things make sure uh, of what you are doing and look uh, as intensively as po possible in the literature for what has been described about the effects and about the original derivation of that monoclonal antibody as an antagonist or as an agent. Okay, uh, good morning. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the kind invitation to be here today in this always successful meeting. Also, it's a pleasure to introduce the next speaker. Uh, Professor Isabel Almeida doesn't need a formal presentation. She's an habitué in our meetings. She has a lot of experience in systemic sclerosis patients. She's in charge of the weak cohort patients of, uh, with systemic sclerosis. She has a PhD in this area uh, and wrote many papers on this subject. Um, so uh, let's move on quickly. We are going to hear Professor Isabel Almeida talking about Taylor therapy in systemic sclerosis. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues. First of all, I would like to thank you all for being here today, namely Dr. Ramos. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to share this table with him. Uh, as you can see, my English is brilliant, so I hope you can uh, understand and uh, follow almost everything about this talk. Uh, systemic sclerosis is uh, uh, a rare and complex disease with a great heterogeneity between patients. And is a rheumatic disease with the highest mortality and has a major impact on the quality of life. Although substantial progress has been made in the understanding the pathogenesis, uh, there is still no, drug, uh, no disease drug uh, modifying that could significantly impact the naturally uh, history of the disease as a whole. The pathogenesis uh, involves an interplay between vascular, immunological, and fibrotic processes. 
uh, and this will result in fibrotic and uh, epox tissues. The skin is the most common organ involved, followed by gastrointestinal tract and then the lungs. However, other organs can be also involved with a different severity. The disease is typically subdivided into subsets based on skin involvement, limited and diffusion. And the previous studies show us that uh, these two subsets are two clearly differentiated phenotypes with regard to clinical and serologic profiles and also different prognosis. But past and recent studies of large cohorts have defied this distinction by highlighting an often neglected heterogeneity among clinical subsets. In this study, with a cluster analysis with around 7,000 patients, they found two uh, major groups that partially overlapped with the binary classification. In an exploratory analysis, they found six additional clusters broadly deferred with regard to clinical features, autoantibody profiles, and survival. Cluster one uh, resemble a limited subset and uh, the six, the diffuse one. Between this, uh, these uh, two clusters, we found four different groups with different prognosis. So they conclude that the, this binary system might omit a wide spectrum of clinical phenotypes, and there is an increasing demand for a future classification in order to personalize approaches to diagnosis and clinical management. This study also proposed a different classification by combining autoantibody and skin involvement. As you can see here, uh, different autoantibodies are correlated with different survivals and also with the different organ involvement severity, like pulmonary and cutaneous. And uh, with uh, this combination, the patients can be classified into seven groups with different prognosis. So, uh, combining autoantibody and uh, uh, skin involvement uh, enables a more pre precise risk stratification of patients and could be used to inform prognosis and disease monitoring in routine practice. In conclusion, we must classify this disease with new variables like molecular signatures in order to best personalize clinical care. In our clinical practice, we can observe different uh, systems for patients with different organ involvements. Some uh, need a little bit more than some pills for their renal, but others require a more aggressive approach, which may include a combination of therapy uh, namely with vasodilators, antifibrotic, and uh, immunosuppression. Hence, their treatment should be tailored. Digital vasculopathy. Digital vasculopathy occurs in almost all patients and can range in severity from renal disease to digital ulcers and potentially gangrene. Digital ulcers are one of the main causes of disease related to pain and morbidity. They are common and recurrent manifestations of the disease and appears in around 50% of the patients. They tend to occur early on, uh, mainly in the first five years of the disease. Around 17% uh, of the patients have a severe digital vasculopathy, uh, namely critical ischemia and gangrene. Digital ulcers slow, uh, ill slowly, are frequently infected, sometimes leads to finger amputations and 
despite the use of vasodilators, they recur. Um, the goals of the treatment um, are to diminish frequency and severity of brain roll, to prevent digital ulcers, limit vascular damage, and uh, also minimize adverse effects of the treatment. The treatment is based on pharmacological and non-pharmacological measures and hardly ever surgery. A general approach includes patient education, such as advising on lifestyle changes, functional adaptation, like eating warm, stop uh, smoking, and so on. Um, and in addition to this, wound care is mandatory to prevent infections. Hyperbaric oxygen could be used in some patients with refractory digital ulcers. A wide range of treatments for renal and digital ulcers are available. However, drug treatment should be uh, tailored to the individual as it can overlap with other vascular complications such as pulmonary arterial, arterial hypertension. With regard to pathophysiology, the medical treatment is based on direct vasodilators, inhibitors of the vasoconstriction and substance uh, that can increase endothelial function. The efficacy of iloprost in the treatment of digital ulcers has been already demonstrated, namely in the healing and the recurrence of digital ulcers. The same happened for CCB blockers, uh, namely nifedipine. And uh, Actually, CCV still the most commonly used agents for digital ulcers management. And in this study, almost one out of four patients with uh, digital ulcers was on CCV alone. The efficacy of Bosentan uh, in the prevention of new digital ulcers was demonstrated uh, in these two studies, RAPID-1 and RAPID-2, uh, namely, if the patients have more than three uh, digital ulcers at the baseline. And what about phosphodiesterase inhibitors? The efficacy of the Dolophil uh, in the healing and the prevention of new digital ulcers has been demonstrated. And the results of this study, said a study, raised a new approach with a combination, combination therapy of Bosentan plus Sidanafil. Your recommendations point to the use of CCV for first line treatment for renal disease and iloprost for severe renal. For digital ulcers, they recommend iloprost and PDAE5. Bosentan should be considered in patients with multiple ulcers. Uh, despite treatment with uh, other drugs. On the other hand, for codinetol, PDE5 uh, can also be used in the renal disease, and iloprost should be used in a refractory disease and in a critical digital ischemia. Iloprost should be given over three to five days every month according to device used for digital uh, healing and a day monthly for digital prevention uh, without summer interruption. Interstitial lung disease is a common complication of systemic sclerosis and is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality. Several risk factors affect the likelihood of developing ILD and its progression. And as you can see uh, in this slide, lung fibrosis, as minimal as it is in CT scan, and a decrease in lung function are related to the mortality. On the contrary, no fibrosis at the baseline is a good prognostic marker. 
the PFT alone has low sensitivity for detecting ILD, especially in early and asymptomatic cases. As you can see here, in this Zurich cohort study, only 38% of patients with significant ILD as an author FPC. So, all patients should be screening for ILD at baseline with a CT scan and also a PFT, not only for its diagnosis, but also its severity. And what about treatment? The goals of the therapy are clinical stabilization and also impede the progression of the disease. Therefore, all patients with clinical intestinal uh, lung disease, which means patients with symptoms, uh, mild to severe uh, fibrosis in a CT scan and a PFT uh, deficit must be treated. Moreover, patients with subclinical ILD with high risk phenotypes should also be treated. The most recommend, recommended medication to data is MMEF and cyclophosphamides. MMEF is first in line when it comes to induction and maintenance. These two studies were the first to demonstrate the efficacy of these two drugs. In the lung study one, cyclophosphamide exceeded the placebo in both less patients worsening and more patients improving uh, their FBC. But the efficacy was no longer evident after they stopped their treatment for a year suggesting that uh, maintenance therapy is required. In lung study two, uh, lung study two showed that treatment with MMEF was associated with similar changes in FBC compared to cyclophosphamide, but with better tolerability. And MMEF has become the desired uh, treatment for ILD in most, uh, in, in most countries. This study provoked a change in the way we approach this disease. Nintadaniv reduced the progression of interstitial lung disease, as you can see uh, in this FVC graph. Nintadaniv slowed it the decline in FPC with or without MMEF on, it is, on its own was just as efficient as MMEF, but in combination with MMEF, uh, the results were superior. Based on this data, Nintendoniv became the first FTA uh, approved therapy for interstitial lung disease. The drug provo provokes limited side effects and the most common one found was diarrhea. The results of this study shows that combining immunosuppression with an initadaniv could provide more uh, benefits in reducing the progression of the interstitial lung disease. And what about biological treatment? Rituximab has been used in several clinical studies, namely in patients with progressive interstitial lung disease. But only a few studies show that rituximab could actually uh, increase FPC. The value of the rituximab was challenged with this large study because the treatment improved skin but not lung fibrosis. So the results from the randomized uh, clinical trials are needed to conclude on the role of rituximab in the management of ILD. The results of these studies uh, suggest that the tocilizumab might preserve lung function in people with early ILD, 
uh, and elevated uh, acute phase reactants. And also that tocilizumab uh, may be a promising uh, target therapy for patients with progressive disease who have few treatment options. On the basis of this data, tocilizumab was approved by FDA as a therapy for interstitial lung disease. ELR has made a strong recommendation for cyclophosphamide or uh, stem cell transplantation in patients with uh, progress, uh, progressive interstitial lung disease. Moreover, uh, this statement predates uh, a stung gland, uh, uh, lung study two and the census trial, and uh, an update is of course needed. Pereo Zeto proposed a treatment uh, uh, algorithm for interstitial lung disease, and this allows for a more tailored therapy, as you can see. Denton et al. have taken a, another step in the path of tailored therapy, incorporating tocilizumab in different stages of the ILD. What about cutaneous involvement? All patients with early diffuse disease should be treated with immunosuppressors, but organ-based complications should always uh, be considered because they may dictate the desired therapy. Methotrexate improved the seeking score in two randomized studies. And is, uh, methotrexate is the most common drug used in mild to moderate uh, skin involvement and MMF in severe cases. Cyclophosphamide is reserved for patients with severe and refractory disease, and stem cell transplant is a viable option for patients with rapidly involving diffuse uh, uh, system sclerosis, a refractory to treatment with immunosuppression. Similarly to what I mentioned about lung disease, biologic therapy is also recommended for skin, especially when associated with other organ involvement. So, capturing the heterogeneity of system sclerosis in a practical approach remains challenging. Although substantial progress has been made, no drug has been approved as a disease-modifying agent in system sclerosis. Uh, simultaneous targeting of multiple cytokine, cyto cytokines by the same drug or with the combination of therapies may be especially promising. Next challenge may be the identification and stratification of patients according to the main underlying mechanisms or main involved pathway to demonstrate the efficacy of therapeutic targets adapted to specific subpopulations. Three levels of stratification, molecular, cellular, and phenotypic level, could guide this identification of new targets and new scleroderma subsets for personalized medicine. Thank you for your attention. Many thanks, uh, Professor Isabel Almeida, for this brilliant talk that overviewed the treatment of the, some of the main problems in systemic sclerosis. Um, we are running out of time. Um, I would like to make, to make a question. What do you think about the paper of um, the role of immunoglobulins in the treatment of uh, systemic sclerosis? So, uh, IVIG uh, um, can uh, uh, be used in these patients. Uh, it uh, can be used uh, uh, for uh, myocytes uh, when the patient uh, has systemic sclerosis and myositis as a, a sparing agent. And uh, it, uh, IVIG could also be used uh, in uh, intracellular lung disease, in severe intracellular lung disease, and also in severe uh, uh, continuous involvement. 
and uh, promising results uh, from uh, studies, from some uh, uncontrolled studies, uh, and the small, are uh, about uh, gastrointestinal involvement. So we need uh, more studies, uh, namely um, randomized clinical studies to, uh, to obtain a, a conclusion. I don't know if we have time for one question from the audience. One question, please. Thank you very much for the very nice lecture. Uh, in the introduction, you underlined that there are three main pathways, vasculopathy, autoimmunity, and fibrosis, yeah. but also that many patients are actually only treated by calcium blockers. So my question to you is, do you think we should use a kind of cocktail in all the patients or those with a diffuse progressive systemic sclerosis treating these three pathways at the same time? Okay, thank you for your, uh, your question. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, different patients can have different pathways involved. So you must, uh, you must uh, um, use the best uh, uh, drug uh, you can uh, um, if you, you can um, choose, the, the, you can uh, uh, understand the pathway involved. So, uh, but you, uh, um, some patients have at the same time inflammatory and fibrosis. So you can choose a, a, a drug that can, that, that can uh, uh, have um, uh, some effects in these two uh, pathways. Yes, uh, we have, uh, in, in English, please. Uh, um, uh, Tocilizumab uh, is an anti-inflammatory and also antifibrotic drug, but also uh, uh, jack inhibitors also. So I hope uh, that jack inhibitors uh, could be uh, promising uh, drugs in, such, in the future for this disease. No, no. So um, thank you very much, Professor Isabel Almeida, uh, for your presentation. I have um, one question uh, about census trial. Um, if you, in your clinical practice, census trial was an add-on therapy with nintadinib. Uh, in what kind of patients we think we must use nintadinib as, as a add-on therapy? And what about perfinidone? Okay. Uh, uh, um, all patients should be screening for uh, intestinal lung disease and for its severity. And uh, CT scan can give you uh, the, uh, um, if the, the patient has uh, ground glass uh, opacities or uh, uh, as um, um, other uh, others. Um, so uh, you can use you you must use uh, anti-inflammatories like, like uh, MMF if the patients have uh, as uh, uh, lung glass opacities and in the others or if the, they have the two patterns you could. Uh, uh, um, do the same for uh, the, the same drugs, intadanib and also uh, mycophenolate. Yeah. Yes. I think that the uh, professor Isabel made those very clear in the in the answers. So we we go um, we go to the coffee break right now.
Vamos fechar isso. Um é apresentação.
Podemos começar? Muito bom dia a todos. Então, vamos fazer uma cerimónia muito, muito curta, porque temos um programa muito cheio, por outro lado também não queremos que as nossas, os nossos convidados eh, eh, demorem muito tempo aqui nesta cerimónia. Um, eu antes de, eh, queria agradecer ao Sr. Professor Fernando Araújo, Presidente do Conselho de Administração do Centro Hospitalar Universitário de São João, a presença dele, é um amigo, uma pessoa sempre presente e nós, eu sei que a agenda dele é muito complicada e ele fez questão de vir aqui exatamente por isso. A Sra. Rita Veloso, que representa o Dr. Paulo Barbosa, que não pode estar presente. O Sr. Professor Henrique Cirne, diretor do Instituto de Ciências Biomédicas da Bela Salazar, agradeço também muito a sua presença e ao Sr. Professor Carlos Vasconcelos. Bom, hum, esta reunião já é, já é tradicional, já vamos com muitos anos de, de realização. Nos últimos anos, como temos feito e de uma forma muito feliz, temos a junção da reunião do Santo António e da reunião de São João, e bem, e tem sido um sucesso, de facto, de, de, sempre que o temos feito, o ano passado não o fizemos por causa da pandemia, e neste momento nós temos um programa recheado, como já, como já viram, um programa intenso, eh, versando os vários temas da autoimunidade, desde sobretudo a terapêutica e depois para temas mais eh, relacionados com eh, autoimunidade sistémica, com alguns temas. Temos 20 convidados estrangeiros, de 10 nacionalidades diferentes, o que também é, é relevante. Temos cerca de 300 inscritos, eh, como sabem a reunião é híbrida, como agora tem de ser, e, portanto, temos aqui as pessoas que estão em presença física e temos eh, várias pessoas também eh, a assistir eh, pela NET. Bom, eu só desejo que a reunião seja um sucesso, que todos apresenta, aprendam e aproveitem ao máximo da experiência dos nossos palestrantes eh, nacionais e estrangeiros e que passem tão bem, tão bem porque não, dois ou três dias agradáveis no Porto, vai estar bom tempo e também desejo isso a todos. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. Uh, faço minhas as palavras do, do Carlos Dias, agradecer a todos uh, o esforço que é que significa vir aqui e o prazer que é, que é enorme para nós. Uh, Obrigado às entidades aqui representadas e, e aproveitava para, para dizer umas palavras sobre uh, o ambulatório, que é onde se decorre, onde decorre a maior parte da atividade de, de, dos doentes com doenças crónicas associadas à, ao sistema imune, as doenças autoimunes, autoinflamatórias e as imunodeficiências. Nós estamos ainda a sair, espero, espero que estejamos mesmo a sair do, do Covid, dessa pandemia. E, e a pandemia ensinou-nos imensas coisas, para além do, do imenso trabalho que nos deu, da, da, das penosas mortes que, que sofremos, etc. Mas nós temos que tirar lições, de facto, do, do, do Covid. Um dos, dos sucessos foi esta história do Zoom. Like Zoom. Portanto, as pessoas podem fazer consulta, é possível fazer consulta dessa maneira. Portanto, há uma revolução que está em curso e que nós temos de ter consciência e administrações mais consciência ainda, uma revolução no ambulatório. O ambulatório a doença está-se nas tintas para a marcação da consulta. Right? Todos sabemos disso. Mas, no entanto, é o que vivemos. Nós temos que ter um ambulatório aberto, com educação da sociedade, para não, não dar cabo dessa abertura e assassinar-nos, digamos, entre aspas, tem que ter capacidade de decisão em tempo real. E nós, até para discutirmos um doente com outra especialidade, no dia da consulta, é um grande favor que os colegas fazem uns aos outros em prol dos doentes. Portanto, eu aproveitava esta, esta nossa reunião da imunologia clínica, no seu geral, para pedir às administrações que... que Uh, deem força, uh, particularmente neste momento, às doenças autoimunes. Uh, por favor, não esperem por uma especialidade que apareça aí da autoimunologia. Infelizmente, é esse o caminho que tem sido no nosso país. Eu não defendo uh, uh, que venha uma especialidade, defendo, sem dúvida, a competência. 
pode ser da especialidade de medicina interna, de reumatologia, da nefro, de neurologia, da obstetrícia, inclusive, temos os nossos autoimunologistas obstetras que fazem parte. Mas, portanto, deem, aproveitem esta revolução que significou o Covid para, para ajudarem a pôr um novo ambulatório. E, e bom, obrigado e bem, Ayrton, e passo a palavra ao professor Henrique Sino, que é o dono da casa mesmo. Obrigado, Carlos. E eu começo exatamente como o Carlos acabou. É muito bom ter-vos nesta casa. Cumprimento o Sr. Fernando Araújo, Dra. Rita Globo, Carlos Dias, meu amigo, querido amigo, o Sr. Carlos Vasconcelos. E é de facto bom ter-vos cá em casa e, sobretudo, no modelo que começa a aproximar-se daquele que é o modelo que nós conhecemos e que é fundamental para a materialização da proximidade e da concretização também do benefício da ciência. Esta relação que estabelecemos, que o ICAS tem estabelecido ao longo dos anos e que se tem vindo a fortalecer junto do Centro Hospitalar Universitário do Porto, é uma realidade que nós queremos, não só constatando a sua evolução, mas queremos dar ainda mais força e maior dimensão. A academia, o conhecimento pré e pós-graduado, tem que andar, obviamente, em conjunto, e as iniciativas desta natureza eh, manifestam essa vontade, por um lado, e materializam essa necessidade. Portanto, é uma área, e o Carlos Vasconcelos sabe bem porque é uma área que para mim é particularmente importante, esta da autoimunidade, e por isso tenho a certeza que o benefício da relação que se vai estabelecer no conhecimento e na partilha do conhecimento vai trazer o benefício àqueles que precisam da evolução desse conhecimento, que são os nossos doentes. Portanto, aquilo que eu desejo é que a eficácia se materialize no benefício e se assim acontecer, já valeu a pena termos encontrado aqui hoje e os próximos dias. E muito obrigado pela vossa presença no ICPAS, que é obviamente também a vossa casa. A doutora Rita Veloso, em representação do Conselho de Administração do, do Hospital Santo António. Centro Bom dia a todos. Uh, em representação dos meus colegas do Conselho de Administração e do Presidente Paula Barbosa, foi com muito carinho que aceitei estar aqui presente. O Centro Hospitalar Universitário do Porto tem realmente um carinho muito especial por esta área. Não fosse também o nosso Presidente, ele próprio, desta área que lhe é tão querida. Um, agradecer ao professor Carlos Dias ao professor Vas Carlos Vasconcelos por manterem uma tradição eu fui efetivamente a última a chegar ao hospital mas acreditem que já a sinto como minha casa uh, professor Henrique Cirne por nos receber sempre também no ICVAS e sei que virei cá muitas mais vezes ainda tenho alguma dificuldade em chegar aos sítios mas eu sei que isso vai agora estritar pegar numa expressão que me é muito querida e que foi lançando o um mote lançado pelo professor Carlos realmente virtual não significa distante e este é o nosso desafio fazer aqui um contínuo de cuidados entre o físico e o virtual mas sem perder ou sem quebrar a proximidade que temos que ter e necessária lembrar que se calhar hoje está muita gente a assistir a este congresso porque lhes permitimos assistir à distância, algo que há uns anos atrás era quase impensável, e também cumprimentar o professor António Araújo, nosso companheiro e nosso também fiel uh, colega, nestas, uh, nestes projetos que são tão importantes unirmos, porque os doentes são um só e vagueiam e entre várias instituições, e nós achamos que é estritando estas relações que temos todos a ganhar e não podemos aceitar que existam doentes de primeira e doentes de segunda, e isso requerece um esforço de todos nós. Agradecer, desejar que sejam dias repletos de cumplicidade, acima de tudo, lealdade para com os doentes e para com os compromissos, e levo o recado, enquanto Conselho de Administração, do novo ambulatório de desafios que aí nos esperam, e tentaremos lutar em conjunto para que isso aconteça. Um bom dia a todos e um bom congresso. E agora o professor Fernando Araújo, Presidente do Conselho de Administração do Hospital São João. Muito bom dia a todos. Desde que é com enorme prazer que estou aqui hoje. 
começava por comentar o professor Henrique Zeno Carvalho, é sempre um prazer estar aqui no ICVAS. O professor tem desenvolvido o nosso sol, enfim, um trabalho extremamente valioso à frente desta instituição, como tem, agora neste momento, com as funções do Conselho Nacional de Educação Médica, das escolas médicas, melhor dizendo, que nem, é, tem feito uma defesa inexorável da qualidade do ensino médico, por vezes contra obstáculos, problemas e questões, e portanto, nisso estamos realmente em conjunto e trabalhando de forma sinérgica nesse tipo de dimensões. Comentar a doutora Rita Veloso, e portanto, no seu nome comentar também, também com a submissão do, do, do Hospital Santo António, do Hospital Universitário de Tratado de Porto, enorme prazer, nós trabalhamos em conjunto também nesta, nestas áreas. Comentar o doutor Carlos Dias e o doutor Carlos Vasconcelos, e em primeiro lugar, agradecer ao amável convite para estar aqui, e esse é um lugar, felicitá-los acima de tudo, por um lado pela, pela qualidade desta reunião, eu tive a ocasião de ver os convidados, os temas, e eu acho que tem aqui uma reunião muito, muito, muito interessante, do ponto de vista técnico-científico, mas acima de tudo felicitá-los pela capacidade que têm tido de trabalho em conjunto. A gente tem, tem feito um trabalho de forma complementar, um trabalho com enorme parceria, e esta questão de terem unido os dois congressos num único só com mais força, com mais vontade, com mais capacidade, eu acho que isso nos deve deixar ficar orgulhosos, nos deve dar um sinal que isso é possível fazer em muitas outras áreas, e a capacidade de nós trabalharmos em conjunto, temos a noção clara que somos seguramente mais fortes, mais capazes, e com mais, com mais capacidade até de conseguir em, coisas diferentes, não apenas em nível nacional, como nacional, e portanto ficar esta nota clara, que esta é a estratégia que deve ser seguida, a capacidade dos hostagens daqui do, do Porto, terem eh, medidas, projetos em conjunto eh, que, de uma forma muito mais abrangente, consigam trazer mais valor para a saúde eh, na região. Uma nota também para a área em si, quer dizer, a área da autoimunidade. Fala-se que, no fim, eventualmente, meio milhão de, de pessoas do, do país que possam, de alguma forma, ter patologia autoimune. É realmente um número um, muito elevado. Com, com, com a cronicidade destas doenças, com o impacto que tem do ponto de vista não apenas clínico, mas também social, profissional, familiar, onde trabalham realmente, como dizia, centenas de médicos, não apenas de centenas, eventualmente será a especialidade mais relevante, mas também, como referiu, da reumatologia, enfim, da nefro, da, da neuro, da obstetrícia, quer dizer, há aqui muitas outras especialidades da medicina geral familiar, que tem também compreendido aqui muito relevante né, nesta área. É cada vez mais também uma área que tem terapias, nomeadamente terapias biológicas, com elevado despendo económico e, portanto, a necessidade de termos especialistas, temos pessoas capazes, com experiência, com capacidade de discriminar, com capacidade de orientar, com capacidade de decidir e nesta área dos doenças é extremamente relevante e daí estas formações e os eventos em si, e com convidados nacionais e internacionais, ajudam-nos a todos nós a perceber melhor, a, a poder tratar melhor os nossos doentes e a poder orientar melhor nestas patologias. Uma nota também que é percebermos o que é que vai também aqui nas doenças autoimunes, qual foi o, o impacto que a Covid teve, e também uma das áreas que temos também seguramente muito a trabalhar e, e a estudar, e, e perceber claramente quer nas crianças, quer nos adultos, também nas doenças autoimunes, e, o que é que vamos esperar nos próximos tempos e, sobre a relação da Covid e esse efeito que vamos ter. E portanto, para terminar mesmo só, desejar-vos um, um ótimo evento, um ótimo simpósio, um ótimo encontro, um, e acredito sinceramente que é com base nesta troca de experiências, nesta capacidade de podermos discutir, de podermos disseminar conhecimento e de podermos dar uma forma também entre nós um, construir redes, um, delinear projetos, um, avançar a ciência, avançar a, a medicina, no sentido de naturalmente a defesa do interesse do utente, que é o que nos traz cá. Muito obrigado a todos. Encerrada a sessão, vamos então prosseguir os trabalhos. Muito obrigado.
So good morning to you all. Um, I am really very happy to be here with you again. And um, I want to salute my co-chair, my dear friend, Brother Neff from the Immunology uh, uh, Service. And uh, she's co-sharing this session with me. And uh, I, I want to salute as well uh, all the online um, participants. This is really a good thing that the pandemic brought to us, this possibility. And uh, I am really happy to be able to uh, talk about immunodeficiencies in this session. Uh, as you know, this area has grown exponentially in the last decades. And from a few disorders, we now have over 500 different diseases that are individually rare, but on the whole, they are, uh, they are important. And this means that all of us, we will uh, see patients with primary immunodeficiencies, and that's why it's so important that we can recognize them. And um, it's my big pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Antonio Marinho, my uh, companion <laughs> in this area of uh, primary immunodeficiencies in the uh, um, immunology uh, unit, uh, in immunology clinical unit of this hospital. And um, he is going to talk to you just about these aspects of autoimmunologists and awareness of infectious diseases. And um, he's an, an internal medicine uh, specialist, he's a, a PhD, and um, uh, he works with me. I'm a pediatrician and we work together in this uh, unit. And we have often uh, regular uh, multidisciplinary uh, consultations and we discuss all our patients together, pediatric and adults. And then we have a transition clinic where we both are present with the patient. And so that the, the transition from pediatrics to adulthood can be uh, as soft and easy as possible. Uh, and so, uh, Dr. Antonio Marino, you have the word. Thank you for Yes. Yeah, very nice, Laura. That's my companion for these years. Uh, I'm going to take the mask, yes. First, I have to say some some disclosures. The first one is uh, uh, I missed some slides that uh, my friend Carlos Vasconcelos gave me because a lot of uh, these pragmatic things and also the meaningful things that we have to discuss have a lot of philosophy, a lot of basic principles that are not only science, and it's very beautiful to say that because this is a spectrum of disease. And thank you, Carlos, for giving me some of these slides that are very beautiful. And, um, and I have to say a few words on this team. The first, I think I saw Margarita Gedge in the presence. I don't know. She is not now, but Margarita Gedge has been my first liaison with the, the, the immunodeficiencies for many years. She, in St. Antonio Hospital, she was the, the leader of these diseases and, and uh, I learned a lot with her. And we were, you were very few. And uh, of course, this rare disease and the patients, uh, they, they didn't have anyone to take them when they become adults and they become to become adults. That was a problem 20 years ago uh, dying, uh, in the first infant. So, there was my my friendship for her and for everything she she, she had to represent for me, and also for Laura that is a fantastic team partner, and we have been done a, a lot of work on that, and the team from the lab that is impossible to work in primary immunodeficiencies without a good lab, and the lab is most in, one of the most important things. They they know a lot of uh, basic principles, but also a lot of clinics that uh, they are learning with us. So the partnership is very nice and multidisciplinarity is the most important thing in this, in this area. So why we people of adult autoimmune diseases have to know a little bit on immunodeficiencies and I'm just show some of the ideas, uh, basic ideas to, for our awareness for, the, for a few moments. So my overview, you just saw this, uh, this slide, and this is absolutely true. 
uh, we think about uh, autoimmune diseases and immunodeficiencies in two different spectrums, immunodeficiencies and infectious diseases, a lot of infectious diseases, but at least one third, one fourth of the patients who present or present itself phenotypically as autoimmune diseases or inflammatory manifestations and not infectious diseases. This is one of the main problems. And in adults, that is a problem because they can pass all the, the infant and, the, uh, and the adulthood without any infection and represent themselves with a, uh, an autoimmune uh, systemic disease. And then we, we can show that they have a primary immunodeficiency. Of course, this is a spectrum, not a, a different place. The spectrum, uh, in, if you can say that autoimmunity is a, a regulatory means sense of the, of the immune system, primary immunodeficiencies are, are also regulatory uh, means sense. So they are the same diseases with different clinical phenotypes, and we have to think on that always when we see different things. And phenotyp phenotypic the patients, it's very important. We have to think a lot when patients appear with different things. And we already know the phenotypes of Sjogren's syndrome, lupus, systemic lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, but all of us has, has, have found typical rheumatoid arthritis patients who are absolutely strong. They respond as very well to immunosuppressive therapy, to biotechnological therapy, and present after that with an opportunistic infection that no one could ever think about, like nocardia or things like that, without so many uh, immunosuppressive therapies. Why this happens? And why the other, the other patient that is absolutely equal makes some immunosuppression, a lot of immunosuppression, but doesn't have any kind of infection? There's something that we don't know, and we have to find it. No, oh, no, it's locked. Uh, okay, thank you. So that's why we are internists. Of course, as Carlos said before, in this area, anyone who wants to do or wants to think about patients can enter in this, in this uh, thinking because they are very rare, of course, but when we put them together, we already have a lot of patients and we have to think about them. A lot of very beautiful slides from my friend. That is when we think about the disease, sometimes we have to think about the zebra thing and not only the, 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 the basic things. And uh, we have really to, to do good phenotypes and to, to think a lot on these patients. So as it has uh, just an overview, as a uh, lot of publications, it's the European Society of Immunodeficiencies, and they classify these diseases in this uh, kind of uh, different uh, phenotypes. And you already see in these phenotypes, I don't know if I have an appoint, appointment to... No. Okay, I, I don't see here. So they already show us the, the antibody deficiencies, but the autoimmune and the immune regulation syndromes and autoinflammatory syndromes as part of the classification of, auto, of primary immunodeficiencies. And in this side, this box, we have a lot of uh, our patients that we can classify. It. And if you think a little bit, you can find these things. Of course, in adults, we see a lot of uh, antibody deficiency patients, specific uh, specific defense antibody deficiency that is not the same thing as having low IgG, and we can discuss this later. And as you see, primary immunodeficiency can be presented as, as itself as allergy, cancer, autoimmunity, infection, all the spectrum, and we have to, to, to start to see these patients like that. So why adult doctors sh should know about PID? First thing is age of onset. Uh, of course, this seems, seems to be basic, but it's not. We think all, all we think that PIDs are in the, in, the, in the infants, five years, six years, seven years old, and never in adults. But if we see our cohort, this is our cohort for our center with patients 
uh, patients from adult and uh, in pediatrician clinics. And you can see that at the age of diagnosis, more or less 40% have more than 18 years old. So it's not predominantly a disease. Sometimes it's because the diagnosis is later or is made late, but sometimes the diagnosis is made when the presentation is done. And a lot of time is that. So we cannot make a diagnosis of a disease that doesn't exist. Uh, another cohort, and this is a very beautiful disease, as I will show you later, the CTLA-4 uh, aploinsufficiency disease. If you see this plot, you see that the mean age of presentation of this disease is mainly autoimmune or auto or inflammatory. It's later, later than 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and even patients with 60 and 70 years old. So we have to think on that. The same thing with this beautiful disease. This is a, a stat uh, gain of function. I will show it later with chronic mucocutaneous uh, candidiasis. And if you see, there is a lot of patients that are diagnosis, have a diagnosis after the 18 years old and different phenotypes can be found. They can have chronic, chronic, chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis and a lot of autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, type one diabetes. So there is a, a spectrum that we should think. So why we should think? Because autoimmunity is an important feature of primary immunodeficiencies. We can, uh, you can show that in many of the, our patients, and I will show in a few patients uh, and a few examples that are paradigmatic in these diseases. In our uh, this cohort uh, that has been published by Magda Kernev Zampaio and Professor Antonio Coutinho, who has been here this morning, we can find this kind of uh, primary immunodeficiencies that have a lot of autoimmunity, uh, se severe autoimmunity combined. And the most, the most simple things are complement deficiency, not the final complement deficiencies that gave us infections like meningococcus or gonococcus, but C2 or C4 deficiency are the most common ones. And the IgA deficiency are the most common ones. And the presentation of these patients maybe or a lot of, of times are autoimmune manifestations like lupus. 50% of C1 key deficiency has have, patients have lupus. So we have to think uh, this is a primary immunodeficiency, not a secondary one. We coming back with this uh, slide for the same disease we saw before. Uh, if you see that granulomas in lung in brainstem, uh, in liver, in spleen, and you can classify this patient as having sarcoidosis. This patient has a, a, a CTLA-4 aploinsufficiency. So this kind of patients present themselves with granulomatosis, hypogammaglobulinemia, and infection. And if we think a lot of sarcoidosis patients have hypogammaglobulinemia, and they have severe infections and have TCD4 lymphopenia, severe TCD4 lymphopenia when they present in cells. And more or less, we don't think on that a lot of times, but have to think on this disease because they have specific treatments and more specific treatments that can be applied to, to these patients, like abatacept, for example. So yeah, that is a, a, a CTLA-4 inhibitor. So we can, we, we can really make better with our patients. And if you look for this kind of presentation of this disease, there is a, a huge phenotype, huge phenotype that you have, patients can have, but mainly this kind of granulomatosis that can be misclassified as sarcoidosis patients, and we can think on that. The other disease that everyone knows uh, is the common variable immunodeficiency is the most common disease in adult patients. And as you see, and there is a spectrum of disease that's absolutely fantastic. Most of the patients present themselves as PTI, autoimmune thrombocytopenia. That's why we, when you have an autoimmune thrombocytopenia, always think about IgG, because it's one of the, the presentations of this disease. But they also have hepatosplenomegaly, infiltration, enteropathy, a very, can be very severe and can be fatal. 
and also cancer diseases. And the main feature of this, of this disease, the main uh, mortality of this disease is not infection, is not autoimmunity, is cancer, and is gastric cancer. So there is a huge spectrum that we can uh, see in these patients. Also, in our, in, in our unit, if we see this kind of selective immunoglobulin deficiency, uh, 124 patients, 20% of them have features of autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, systemic lupus, type 1 diabetes, and organ specific. Uh, and we, sh we should seek on that. Also, from our cohort, this is a slide from Kisi Guevara. He uh, works on Madrid. He works with us in our service and made his, his, his PhD and his postdoc in our uh, with, uh, with us also. And she compared the, um, the two uh, cohorts of Madrid and Porto uh, on, uh, on common variable immunodeficiencies. And she found that one third of the patients, of course, develop chronic lung disease with bronchiectasis and infections. The year of the, the diagnosis, the mean age is 33 years old, as you see, not 12, not 14, 20, 33 years old. But we also found that uh, the phenotypes don't overlap everywhere. They have phenotypes of uh, autoimmune diseases, like 30%. And the patients who have phenotypes of autoimmune disease doesn't have, most of them don't have a phenotype of, of infection. 80% don't overlap. So we can miss the diagnosis easily. It's not difficult to miss the diagnosis. 80% don't overlap infection autoimmune features. Some examples like this patient with 42 years old presents himself with hypogamma globulinemia, pancytopenia, uh, a lot of infections, and we found a timoma in this patient and diagnosis was good syndrome, also a, a disease that makes a combined syndrome of immunodeficiency. And that's why I, I put here in red the combined immunodeficiency because we miss a lot of combined immunodeficiency in adults. We are our mind is setting for combined immunodeficiency as skewed patients with RAC gene diseases, so the very severe patients, the bubble babies. But we have combined diseases, not severe, that are misdiagnosed as primary, as combined immuno, as uh, common variable immunodeficiency. And the, dif the difference is phenotype. The phenotype is different. This patient has a lot of inf a lot of different in patients, infections like viral infections, ABV, CMV, sometimes fungal infections that we don't see in, in common variable immunodeficiencies. And when we start to see that something else is happening, the patient has a, a different disease, or maybe a very late common variable immunodeficiency with a lot of senescence of lymphocytes. But this is not the common side, the common finding that we have. The other two patients, just to think a little bit, Carol showed this morning, why two lupus patients, one of these with five milligrams of prednisolone with nothing more makes a PML. What's that? Why? We didn't, we didn't diagnose these patients uh, uh, on time. Of course, it's, these patients are from 2006, 2007, I think. Maybe they had something like that, or maybe she can, they can have autoantibodies and cytokines. That is not the primary immunodeficiency, but is a phenocope that makes some copies of primary immunodeficiency. And some autoimmune diseases with a lot of autoantibodies also have, or may have, antibodies anti-L6, anti-interferon gamma, anti-anything, anti-L17. And they present themselves as the same copies as some kind of primary immunodeficiencies. Another example that was shown this morning, another primary immunodeficiency that the, the mainstream is levedo and vasculitis. A very severe levedo that seems polyarteritis nodosa, but doesn't have the other features and is more common in women, is more common after 40 years old, not in primary infancy. And sometimes they have a lot of different phenotypes and the treatment is immunosuppressive therapy, not any kind of different things and sometimes anti-TNF therapy. So why doctors should know about PID? Why adult doctors? Because we also have to think on treatment. 
uh, and in secondary immunodeficiencies. And I put a little bit of secondary immunodeficiency because we have to think a little bit on that also. Treatments, immunoglobulins for those who don't have uh, enough IgG or specific IgG. Some patients have IgG but don't have specific antibodies, that is different. Immunosuppressive therapies, JAK inhibitors, biotechnological therapies, of course, gene therapy, transplantation, everything you can see. In this slide, it's um, a lot of things we can do for these patients, even uh, giving some kind of cytokine that is missing or have some autoantibody. So these primary immunodeficiencies are also a good biological model for secondary immunodeficiencies. In secondary immunodeficiencies, we are missing a lot, uh, uh, and they have, sometimes they are, uh, or they are not uh, diagnosed on time. As you see in this slide, you can find that we are using hundreds of drugs that then gave copies, copies of this disease. And we have to think on that because sometimes we are missing diagnosis. And why? Specifically on uh, gamma globulins, on def uh, deficiency of gamma globulins, we use a lot of T cell depletion. We are not, even in autoimmune or cancer patients, we are not making the diagnosis on time. As in this paper, you are going to see that just 20% of the patients who have hypogamma, symptomatic hypogamma globulinemia derived from a secondary immunodeficiency are making gamma globulins on time. And that's the dramatic. It's not only Portuguese data, it's, Port it's European data. Your clinical practice is not only for the autoimmune patients, but also for hematological patients, from cancer patients. And we see on on the emergency rooms, patients with uh, uh, bacterial infections, invasive bacterial infections, who have made this cell depletion for something, and we treat them with antibiotics, and sometimes we forget, forget that they, they don't have these cells or they don't have IgG, and they needed to, to, to be aware of that to treat these patients. So we are leaving the concept of the number of uh, IgG, but if you have less than four grams per liter, of course they need IgG, but if they don't have specific antibodies, they also need IgG. You can find that with maybe pneumococcal uh, polysaccharide vaccine. You can give the patient and see if they make antibodies to the, the polysaccharide pneumococcal. In patients who have 500 or 600, sometimes don't have specific antibodies and they will need immunoglobulins to survive for an invasive infection. Another example that we can see with the treatment of PID is how we can unmask common variable immunodeficiency in uh, or other diseases with biotechnologicals. And sometimes it's difficult to separate what is secondary of what is primary. And this, this kind of example is a pathognomonic of a, a thing that we can find in our clinical practice. A patient with thrombocytopenia, Immune thromocytopenia makes rituximab as upfront therapy. And a few months later, they don't, they don't have IgG and is having infections. And why? Rituximab doesn't take plasma size. So what we have made in this patient, this published, and we have sometimes these patients, we have found this kind of patients, it's common variable immunodeficiency that has been unmasked by a B-cell depletion therapy. You don't have this kind of patients as an upfront therapy. One gram of rituximab does, doesn't have to give hypogamma globulinemia. So these are the problems that we deal every day and we discuss every day in our unit. And I think they are very important problems. Just to finish and to, to speak just a little bit about phenocopies. And I think phenocopies are a, a, a very important main feature in this, in this disease. Uh, and these patients have a lot of polyautoimmunity and severe opportunistic infections. Sometimes they have both. This is different from common variable immunodeficiency. And they are very, very difficult to treat. One of the examples uh, is antibodies, anti-LTNF, anti-T, uh, interferon gamma, anti-IL-17, and this axis, the, the axis, the 
of IL-212-23 or the axis of the IL-17 or the axis of the, um, the STAT-3 can be uh, att attached for antibodies and cytokines. One of the main examples is the anti antibody syndrome and the interferon gamma antibody syndrome. And now we can find it. People with mycobacteria, but also with salmonella infections and staph infections who are invasive, difficult to treat and resistant to the treatment and without malabsorption, uh, they are taking their pills, they don't, they don't have resistance to the antibiotics and we found that we have to sink on antibodies. Maybe the patient has a natural resistance to that. And the French team has showed uh, two months ago uh, in COVID infection that 15% of patients with more than 60 years old uh, in COVID, in, with severe COVID infection, had antibodies and die interferon alpha. This is a very beautiful feature that we think we have to see on autoantibodies against cytokines. And if you see the clinical picture on the right, the classic one, the mutations of IL-17 in the left, antibodies and IL-17, for example, we see that the clinical features are similar. As you see, in JMCSF antibodies, IL-6 antibodies, and interferon gamma antibodies. So we have to sync on these copies of primary immunodeficiency in adult patients with these bizarre features. These bizarre features should, should be sought when we find these patients. And this is a, a, an example of a patient with anti-interferon gamma autoantibodies with a triple infection with Treptococcus, varicella zoster, and mycobacterial patients. And the patients, even taking biotechnological steroids, they march, don't have this kind of infections. If you see this patient, an autoimmune patient who makes steroids, I think this patient doesn't have a secondary immunodeficiency. They have to have something else like that. So one of the pearls that I think is important in this, in this main is that uh, we have to think on that. When we have prolonged infections, maybe we should not stop antibiotics and stay, just taking prolonged antibiotics and prophylactic antibiotics and start to, um, to the diagnosis of this disease. Going to an anti-cytokine profile or going to West to find this uh, the, the gene and don't stop immediately the prophylaxis because they will fall out again. Two or three examples just to finish. Uh, Joan has a lot of experience on, on this disease, this kind of phenocopies. Just to give an example, STAT1 gain of function, one of the diseases that can be diagnosed in adults. Apple, GATA2 aploid sufficiency, also another disease that can be diagnosed in, in, um, in adults and have, they are phenocopies of primary immunodeficiencies and they have a lot of autoimmune features and a lot of infections together. The GATA2 syndrome is the elephant in the house. They have everything that you can see. Inflammatory disease, uh, myelodysplasia, uh, alveolar proteinosis, uh, PML, granulomas, everything you want, arthritis, warts, and these patients can be diagnosed late in the disease and you have to think on this inflammatory myelodysplasia. They have a kind of feature that is very, very typical. This is the, in some of these patients, Actually, in patients who have, for example, mycobacterial infection with this disease, have monocytopenia. And this is a very important feature. If you found, for example, a mycobacterial infection in a patient with less than 200 monocytes per micro in the, in the blood, you have to think on this disease. The other example, the stat one gain of function, also disease that can be diagnosed later. You also found the chronic mycocutaneous disease, but you can find these patients with polyautoimmunity, with hypothyroidism, type 1 diabetes, cytopenia, systemic lupus. So we have to think on that. And just for a few words on treatments, these patients are really very difficult because they can have a lot of infections, difficult infections, but a lot of inflammatory disease. And maybe Jackie Nibs can be one of the most important therapy for, for the inflammatory features, but they have to be discussed in a multidisciplinary team, they have to start antibiotics, they have to keep antibiotics, they have to make some immunosuppressive therapy. These are very tough patients. Just to finish, another 
kind of uh, immune disease. That's just for an example to think. When we are, we are using Jackie Nips, all the times we are thinking on uh, air zoster as a, a feature of infection that can be very difficult to treat and can be a lot of morbidity. This kind of disease, like the TIC2 deficient, one of the, these uh, receptors, is already 20, 12 years old uh, discovered. Uh, the main feature of the disease is the recurrence of air zoster infection. So if we see a lot of air zoster infection, in patients that uh, are not using uh, jack inibs, even with jack inibs, they are rare in occidental, in occidental patients. We have to think if they have problems on jack uh, receptors, uh, if the problem is coming and coming and coming. Just to show you how jack uh, inhibitors work and they can uh, block almost all cytokines so they can give anything you want. So that's why adult doctors need to know a little bit of primary immunodeficiencies and this kind of spectrum. I'm so sorry to give a lot of examples, but uh, I think it's important to think. And don't forget different patients with different phenotypes. We have to think a little bit more and go a little bit lower, a little bit longer to find something different. And maybe you can find specific therapies for them. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, we will take the questions at the end of the two presentations. So we are now moving to the next talk. And I would like to present to you Professor um, uh, João Varela Neves. He is a pediatrician uh, working at the primary immunodeficiencies unit in Hospital Dona Estefania in, in Lisbon. I can say that he is an expert in immunodeficiencies and uh, also he has a, a long, I can say also experience in these kind of diseases. He's also the director of the uh, pediatrics department of Hospital de Luz in, in Lisbon. And he's very close to the European Society of Immunodeficiencies. He is a member of its uh, board. Uh, he also is actually at the moment uh, the, co the uh, member of the coordination commission of the Portuguese group for primary immunodeficiencies. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Neves. And sorry, this is an important issue I'm waiting. Uh, his presentation is tailored therapy in primary immunodeficiencies. Thank you very much for the for the invitation. I would, <coughs> I would first like to thank the organizing committee for for inviting me. Uh, in the name of the name of Professor Carlos Vasconcelos, thank you very much for inviting me, and my dear friend Antonio Marin, thank you. But uh, uh, I have just realized that this is unformatted because I did this in Mac. Sorry for this. Um, and uh, my talk will be I will guide you through PIDs, primary immunodeficiencies, and then. Um, very quickly on precision medicine or tailored medicine before next generation sequencing and after next generation sequencing. As my disclosures, uh, the first one I think is not important, but uh, one of the most important ones is that I'm a pediatrician. I'm not an adult physician. And uh, um, I think that my task is much easier than yours. It's much more easy to, to be a pediatrician and treat PID patients in pediatrics without other com comorbidities than adult physicians. Um, and then I have another disclosure to make because um, as I told you one minute ago, um, I was invited by my good friend, Antonio Marin. Um, and uh, when I was uh, thinking about my presentation today, I excluded auto-inflammatory syndromes that because in the previous title of his talk was autoimmunologists and autoinflammatory syndromes when they should suspect. So I excluded that part. So we have to talk after this. Uh, but if we want, we can have a discussion about autoinflammatory syndromes uh, after my talk. I will not talk about gene therapy. There's no more, there's no more precision medicine than gene therapy, but I think we're not uh, in the moment uh, completely updated on that. And I don't think that's exactly the... Um, uh, 
we're not uh, in the, the right moment to talk about that because it's a very closed field. Uh, not many patients have, uh, have um, we, can, there, we don't have many patients that have access to gene therapy, so I excluded that. And I will try not to talk about hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Uh, I think it's uh, more or less impossible to avoid hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, but I'll try to keep it simple. So when we're uh, thinking about PIDs, I will try to guide you through the history of tailored therapies in PIDs. I think this is the, the, the manuscript that I use most times in presentations because it's where everything started in PIDs with General Bruton and uh, the discovery of, discovery of uh, gamma globulinemia. And I think that it's the first example of tailored therapy in PIDs. This was, he was in army and uh, one of the, um, one of the, the generals, I think, had lots of infections. So this is the list of infections that he had. And they had just received this wonderful machine that was a Tizelius moving boundary machines. And this is completely unformatted. But what I wanted to show is that the patient in the Tizelius moving boundary machine didn't have a gamma fraction. So they tried to, to give, they started to give gamma globulins at that time, intramuscular gamma globulins, and he improved a lot. So this is the first trial of tailored medicine in PIDs, giving something that the patient doesn't have on the basis of his disease. So this is why a gamma globulinemia is here in the tree of clinical immunology. It's where everything started, and then things try, uh, progressively became more complicated with more genes, more diseases. And when we reached the, the 70s, we already had these diseases uh, in the classification of PIDs. And on the right, we have the first bubble boy from Philadelphia that was treated for severe combined immunodeficiency. And at that time, it, this was amazing. They knew that he, he didn't have T lymphocytes. He had to be in a sterile environment. They put him in a bubble and then they transplanted him. So this is a, a major achievement in PIDs. But um, again, sometimes when I give my talks, uh, people complain because I go too much into basic immunology, but, um, and I will try not to, to do this this time. I'll try to go into clinics, but to be honest, I think that we can't do medicine if we don't do the basics. And only if we know the basics, we can act and treat our patients as they should be treated. So as for primary immunodeficiency or PIDs, what is a primary immunodeficiency? Uh, by definition, is a congenital dysfunction of any component of the immune system. So as we can imagine, there are so many components in the immune system, so there, may, there must be so many immunodeficiencies. And what are the manifestations of PIDs? We only have to know what are the, the functions of the immune system. What does our immune system does? First, they fight infections and create immunological memory. So they will get, some of the patients will get recurrent infections or unusual infections. But as Antonio Marino said uh, a few moments ago, it, the immune system is very important to first regulate, finally tuning the, the inflammation. So uh, if we have one, auto, uh, one thing that is missing or is working too much in a very strange pathway, inflammation will be doomed and we have hyperinflammation or hypoinflammation. And in, mo in many cases, it's caused by congenital um, defects. Then we have to tolerate ourselves. So autoimmunity is one of the most important features of PIDs. And in a, in a def different way, we have to tolerate non-self. When we have an infection, we have to have the signals that stop the inflammation, they stop the, the production of autoantibodies. And if that's missing, we'll have an exhaust immune system, as Antonio told you before. And then we'll have lymphoproliferation, granulomatous disease, and those kinds of things. And then we have the cell growth surveillance, and we have cancer. I will not talk about cancer, but that's one of the most um, important topics in PIDs. And many, many cancers, not only hematologic uh, cancers, are caused by primary immunodeficiencies. But that would be a one hour talk and I don't have that time. So when I first started my residency, it was in 2005 and there were 80 PIDs described. And those PIDs, they were almost always like this, one phenotype, one gene, 
one gene, 100% penetrance, and one disease. And at that time, these were the classic PIDs and the PIDs everybody talked about, which were severe combined immunodeficiency, a gamma globulinemia, chronic granulomatous disease, neutropenia, hyper IgE, and those kinds of diseases. And it's very interesting because when I was thinking about tailored therapy, I love history and I love my antecessors. So I have to, to start from the beginning. And all these therapies have tailored therapies. All these uh, diseases have tailored therapies. So I will guide you through that. So is there a place for teletherapy when fighting infections? I will start by giving some examples. When I was in Paris in um, Alain Fischer's uh, unit, we have this, this um, girl. Th this x-ray is not from her, but it could be. Uh, it was a four-month girl born from consanguineous parents that was transferred from Lyon with a pneumocystis gyrovesi pneumonia, disseminated CMV infection without IgM with a T-cell lymphopenia, uh, an important anemia, and a diagnosis of uh, SCID, a severe combined immunodeficiency, was made. And she was proposed for allohematopoietic stem cell transplantation at the age of four months. And this, for me, this was, this was a very important mark because everything was uh, prepared for transplant. <clears throat> and in the week before the transplant, Alain Fischer went to the clinics and told, why 6.5 of hemoglobin and 93, 93 of VGM? And then folic acid was dosed and she had none. This wasn't a severe combined immunodeficiency. This was a proton coupled folate transportant deficiency. And she was treated with folinic acid with total normalization of the immunological pattern. So this is tailored therapy at its best. So this is very important. But what about severe combined immunodeficiency? Um, real skid. Can we do teletherapy? And very briefly, we, we, we got this, uh, this girl from Angola. She was born like this. Sorry, a few, a few months later, two months later, she was like this. She weighed, she, the, the birth weight was three kilograms. At the age of four months, she had disseminated CMV, uh, rotavir enteropathy by rotavirus, disseminated BCG, and a horrible graft versus host disease. She weighed two kilograms at the age of four months. And we had to tailor therapy to get her up to date to transplant. So she had therapy for CMV, quadruple therapy for BCG, cotrimoxazole for, P for PJ. We had enteral immunoglobulin given by an ileostomy to treat rotavirus. But we always have to give immunosuppressants to treat GVHD. So we had to give cyclosporin, steroids, and then she was transplanted and she was cured. So this is completely tailored therapy to the patients and to their diseases. What about congenital neutropenia? This is easier, I think, and I think most of you have experience on that, but this is um, a little boy with this horrible skin infection with that we diagnosed with GFI1 um, immunodeficiency or neutropenia, and she was, he was treated with GCSF, and she's doing very good, well going to school with tailored therapy to congenital neutropenia. But in neutropenia, I think this is one of the most uh, beautiful uh, tailored medicine uh, examples. Uh, when um, in 2010, I met this boy that was 15 years old, that was hospitalized the first time at the age of three months for neutropenia. He had a neutropenia, he had a hypogamma globulinemia, multiple skin infections, lung infections. He had been sent to the reference center in Paris for a diagnosis. He hadn't been diagnosed. It was in 2005 or something like that, or 2000s, early 2000s. And um, when I first met him, I evoked the diagnosis of Wim syndrome, which is um, uh, an, a neutropenia that also has a hypogamma globulinemia. He had a hypercellular myeloid lineage. But the, in the results of the BM aspirate, there was no myelocathexis that is the hallmark of this disease. So we couldn't establish a diagnosis. A gene uh, sequencing was ordered. We tried to treat him with GCSF, immunoglobulins. The patient improved, but then he developed secondary myelofibrosis, secondary to GCSF. We had to stop GCSF. The myelofibrosis resolved, but uh, he had very, very skin, uh, severe, severe infections. He was proposed to, to transplant, but he had these horrible legs with um, ulcers 
all around the legs. And we, at that time, we isolated a virus, a trichodysplasia spinulosa associated polyoma virus all over his legs, and came back the sequencing that we had asked. And he had a CXCR4 mutation leading to WIM syndrome. And um, uh, we sent him for a clinical trial of directed precise medicine with um, a CXCR4 antagonist, Plerixa4, in the US. So what is CX in the, when we have the, the leukocyte precursors in the marrow, we have two forces. One force is CXCR2 that keeps the, sends the, the blood cells, the white blood cells to the blood. And then we have another one, the CXR4 that keeps them inside the, um, the, the, the marrow and doesn't allow the, the blood, the white cells to come out. So they have neutropenia. Uh, and when we have gain of function gain of function mutations in CXR uh, CR4, they, the 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 white cells are produced, but they don't leave the marrow and they die inside the marrow. So what happens is this: they they, they get stuck in there. So we, if we use at that time Plerixa4, which is an antagonist of CR uh, CXR4, um, was developed by the the NIH group. We sent our patient there. He was a very, very sick patient, and he started therapy with CXCR4. And uh, uh, it's patient one in this paper, uh, in this patient, in this paper. So as you can see, he completely healed uh, his ulcers. He got rid of the virus. His white cells improved. He stopped IVIG. He was uh, he transferred to the adult uh, to the adult care, and I don't know how he's doing now in the last uh, four or five years, but it, it's a game changer for him. So this is a very beautiful example of tailored therapy, and then we have the classic uh, administration of gamma interferon in uh, chronic graminolomatous disease and some kinds of disease, but that helped us a lot. And Tony Marin talked a little bit about MSMD, uh, Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease and salmonella. And this is a very good example. This was um, a gypsy girl. It was three months. She had a Campylobacter sepsis at the age of two months. At the age of three, uh, CNS and PMA caused by salmonella Heidelberg. We had given meropnem, intratecal chloramphenicol. She was getting worse, high fever worsened clinical condition, ventilated osmotic therapy for his brain edema, her brain edema. And then we said, okay, she must have an MSMD. She will need gamma interferon. So we gave gamma interferon that will bypass the IL-12 uh, deficiency, receptor deficiency. And that's what we did. We started in front gamma at three times a week with complete resolution of the clinical picture. Interestingly, we still don't have a gene uh, cause for this disease because everything came out um, a negative, but she responded very well to the therapy. And this is another example. We received this girl from Cap Verde. Uh, she was always with fever, musitis, arthritis, and, um, and uh, fasciitis. She had recurrent fasciitis. When, uh, when she was transferred to Lisbon, she had a musitis at the age of 17. 18 months, 20 months, requiring fasciectomies, horrible fasciectomies. Every bug grew from her leg. We had E. coli, Enterobacter, Fusobacter, Necroforum, Klebsiella pneumonia, and this was impossible to treat. She was discharged. She would come back in another place with uh, fasciitis and musitis. So at that time, we got her gene sequencing, uh, hexome sequencing, with, uh, never mind the gene, it's an oval PID, but we identified this gene that is a very important uh, um, uh, uh, component of the metabol metabol uh, Krebs cycle, and it regulates inflammation and regulates the ending of curing infection. And we did some, some, ther some um, experiments, and we understood that interferon gamma upregulated IRG1 and could help us treat these patients. So that's what we did. We started prophylactic um, therapeutic in gamma and then kept her on uh, and prophylactic in gamma and she was by a miracle cured and she had no relapse and she's now seven years old. 
So I hope I convince you that we can have tailored medicine in fighting infections. But as I told, there were 80 PIDs in 2005. When I finished my residency, there were 180. And 2020, 416. And now we are over 500. So the, what is interesting at, at the field grow with this one gene, multiple phenotypes, multiple genes, the same phenotype, incomplete penetrance, sometimes digenic disease. So this is a fascinating field. And uh, Antonio Marino already told you what this patient had, but I think it's very, very important. He had coronic uh, mucocutaneous candidiasis in infancy, but also had lots of autoimmunity. He had autoimmune hepatitis and Evans syndrome. He failed to respond to steroids, to MMF, to serolimus, and then we had either identified again a function mutation in STAT1. And this is very, very important. In STAT1, we have diseases by having too less or having too much. When we have too less the STAT1, we have lots of virus, we have lots of diseases caused by infectious phenotypes, mycobacteria. But when we have too much, as STAT1 signals through uh, intron, uh, type 1 interference, a signal through uh, STAT1, we have in one, in one side, we have a dysfunction of IL-17 and TH-17 cells, so we have candida, and then we have too much interferon alpha leading to autoimmunity. So we started JAK inhibition with ruxolutinib, uh, 10 milligrams twice a day without, and it just cleared the candidiasis, controlled autoimmunity, and let's see how this finishes. This is very recent. So, but this was, uh, to the moment, it was a very good response. Let's see how it goes. Uh, not all patients respond very well, so let's see. But we treated candida with the jack and so I think this is amazing. So I will not talk about inflammation and, and cancer. Uh, I can't avoid talking about very early onset IBD and IBD in general. Um, and Tony talked about TIC2. Uh, TIC2 is very important for some uh, cytokines, and uh, uh, depending on the mutation, it can abolish uh, IL-10 function, but it can abolish other cytokines. And it, it's in incredible because our four patients with TIC2 deficiency only have IBD because the only cytokine, the, the, the mutation, the, the location of the mutation only abolishes signaling through IL-10. And so it doesn't have viral infections, it doesn't have allergy, it only has inflammatory bowel disease. So, so that you know, this is the more or less the, uh, the overall picture of um, inflammatory bowel disease in pediatrics. We now identify more or less 30% of monogenic causes in IBD. In our cohort, it's a little bit different because it's, uh, we choose uh, severe patients and um, earlier patients, we have about 50% of genetic causes. But when, when we screen, up to the age of six or up to the age of 18, it will be about 15% to 20%. But this changes completely their lives because they can treat it by teletherapy. But we also call these uh, regulate uh, these um, genes that regulate inflammation, regulate uh, immunity. Their defects, which they have now have another name, they are included in PIDs, but they are the PERDs, primary immunoregulated disorders. And now we have almost half of our diseases are from this group, presenting with lipoproliferation, granulomatous autoimmunity. And as we had for STAT1, we have this for STAT3. It's exactly the same. When we don't have enough STAT3, we have job syndrome. When we have too much, we have inflammatory uh, enteropathy. We have Alps-like lipoproliferation, and they do benefit with JAK inhibition. And it's all these new genes and new, th and new diseases. So almost finishing. At, in two th uh, 2014, we had a, a, our hematology unit had this Evans syndrome. He was treated normally with the basic uh, therapies, immunoglobulin followed by steroids. At the age of, uh, in 2018, he moved to Seville. He had 18 years old, so we transferred to adult care in Seville. But then everything changed for him. He was diagnosed with CVID, common variable immunodeficiency. He had lots of infections, hypogamma. He had a granulomatous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease treated with MMF. And then a very, very severe enteropathy installed, 
completely untreatable. He was hospitalized almost um, uh, two thirds of the year in 2020 because of the enteropathy required total parental nutrition. She weighed 35 kilograms and the mother visited us and we have this, um, we study every patient with Evans uh, uh, that uh, occur before the age of 18. We sequence all of them. So we included, we asked for DNA from the civil colleagues to sequence him and he had because we now know that pediatric even syndrome is associated with monogenic causes. And uh, we can't forget what the Antonio said a few moments ago. At this moment, as we speak, 30% of CV, CVID cohorts are monogenic. So we have to look for monogenic causes. So this patient had a CTLA4 mutation with haploid sufficiency. As you know, CTLA4 is a very, very important molecule in the regulation of co-stimulation. So in the absence of CTLA4, we'll have too much co-stimulation. So we'll have a continuum of, um, of uh, uh, too much production of uh, immune stimuli. So the patients will get lymphoproliferation, hypogamma by exhaustion, and uh, lots of autoimmunity. We know that we have a batacept and the batacept cures is an, is an agonist of CTLA-4, so we can use this to treat these patients. So she had an infectious screening that was negative, so we proposed the colleagues in Seville to start the Batacept using this scheme, 10 milligram kilogram, um, zero, two, and four weeks, and then five milligram monthly, and it completely resolved enteropathy. Glial, he doesn't require transfusion and hasn't been admitted this year. It was a complete change of the patient's clinical status. Apparently, this will not last very much. The patients treated with this, with a batacept and CTLA-4, apparently do relapse, and they do have to have other options. But for the moment, we're very happy. Let's see what happens. And this is the cousin of a CTLA-4, which is LRBA. Um, LRBA, the picture of LRBA, also benefits from a batacept. And uh, it's very similar to CTLA-4 deficient because in, in general, what, about this, what LRBA does, it rescues CTLA-4 from the tra trash and sends it back again to the membrane. So when we don't have CTL uh, LRBA, we don't have CTLA-4 and it's the same. And to end, I would just like to give you this uh, and another uh, chart uh, table, which is uh, the, all the, all the um, the precision medicine that is available. Most of those are, as you can see, we have there the CTLA-4 and LRBA. We have the APDS that I'm not going to talk about, which is the P3 gain of function that benefit, that hyperactivates mTOR and benefits from anti-mTOR uh, therapies like the serolimus and has lineozilib, which is a direct P3K inhibitor. And then we have Start, start gain of function, and we have, sorry, and we have all those autoinflammatory syndromes that benefit uh, from um, tailored therapy. This is, a, this is just another uh, table showing the same, just if you want to have the, the reference in the, in the slide. I'm not going to talk very much about autoinflammatory, auto but I have to show this because um, it's a very impressive uh, clinical picture. This was a, um, a, 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 a boy that was born a preterm with um, hepatosplenomegaly developed. In the, she was, he was hospitalized since birth. He had these bunches of uh, urticaria, arthritis, hepatosplenomegaly, very, very high fever and we diagnosed with MVK deficiency as a severe form of MVK deficiency with the acidotic mevaluria. And then we treated her with very, very high dose IL-1 blockage, first with anakinra and then canakinumab. And we were able to control this patient until transplant and he get transplant. And now he's a three or four year old boy that is treated from his disease and has a normal life. So this is the, the clinical picture of STAT3 gain of function. And I have only have this, um, this slide to show you the, this one on the right. When I saw this, um, this, um, this paper in 2020, uh, 
I thought, this is absolutely incredible. We have a patient with type 1 diabetes installed under insulin therapy, has a novel diagnosis of start one gain of function, gets jack inhibition, and resolves diabetes. And this was, this was a diabetes that had, uh, was installed for more than two years. Uh, so it shouldn't have much pancreas left. Uh, but this is very important. So we are now, at the moment, we are screening all our type 1 diabetes uh, presenting in um, early childhood until the age of six or in familial uh, type 1 diabetes with a, uh, a parent, a father, and a child that is uh, affected. And now we are getting some results uh, from the genes. We have uh, incredible results. Uh, we don't have, we haven't treated patients with type 1 diabetes with um, teletherapy, but I hope that in uh, four or five years' time, we can tell you that we have cured one or two type 1 diabetes. Uh, but um, let's see, the future will tell us if, uh, if not, but I really, really think that we will be able to do this. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I would invite you. Uh, or uh, everyone that is interested in PIDs or clinical immunology, please join JPIP, which is the Portuguese group for immunodeficiencies. Uh, it's a very warm group, and we will be very, very glad if you could join us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. João Farela Neves, for this excellent presentation. Now, uh, you can put your questions, the discussion is open. I would also like to thank you. It was really a very interesting presentation with lots of clinical cases. And I enjoyed particularly the last photo. <laughs> it was really, we also have a good time in primary immune efficiencies. Um, thank you very much. Both very good talks, excellent, and opening our mind. The question is, when we return home to the ambulatory clinical practice, uh, and even now we are thinking in patients that could have more than what we diagnosed. And, uh, and uh, so we were not asking NGAs uh, and so on. Uh, shall we move to 80 and asking every time, give us some clues. What can we, I'm sorry, what? That, I don't have it, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I was very honest when I said in the beginning that I think that you have, that you have a, your task is very, is very different from ours and it's much, uh, our task is easier. You have a very difficult time in uh, choosing the patients. In pediatrics, very easy, I think. Uh, in your case, I don't know. Um, you have to think, like Antonio said, of what is different from this patient from the others. Uh, it's very difficult. But in pediatrics, we now we are convincing our rheumatologists and, uh, uh, to screen every lupus, for example, to do NGS in every lupus. That uh, starts in the age of uh, pediatrics. And why is that? Uh, we now know from uh, mo there are not many papers published, but we know that more or less 40% of lupus, pediatric lupus, are caused by inborn errors and are caused by TNF-alpha IP3 mutations leading to A20 haplosufficiency. So it's very difficult to know these things and just do nothing. But from the other side, it's very different to do this to everyone. So uh, in the adult uh, clinics, I don't know. Uh, in pediatrics, I really think we should move on to screen everyone uh, with uh, uh, poly autoimmunity and uh, because we will save a lot of money if we discover and if we diagnose these diseases. In the adults. <laughs> Mask first. <laughs> so first, I'm lucky not to be a pediatrician because so lucky. <laughs> see different. We, we see different kind of patients. That's why we see different phenotypes. One of the beautiful things of that what shows well in what I think of 
found that the same gene, the same mutation, sometimes gave us different phenotypes. And we still don't know very well why that happens, but it's true. And sometimes we are asking for a phenotype that, okay, that, that cannot be, but then we found the gene and said, okay, it's this, this, this problem. Sometimes we have to make functional tests to see if the, this is the gene, the right gene. But sometimes there's some kind of genes that are happening in our patients that don't have the, pheno the, the, the real phenotype. It's uh, difficult also with the pediatricians. But I uh, just like to add one thing, that is that the NGS and the gene sequencing are a very dangerous tools because we have to know how to interpret the data and how to make what to make of a data that is given to us because now at the moment i would say that um, in every 10 patients that we screen uh, five or six will have a variance of a non-significance yes. and what we do in our hospital is that we get the results in raw and then we analyze the data ourselves and then we do functional tests ourselves to prove the, um, uh, the result that we get. But that's easy in pediatrics because the patients normally are virgin. They don't have lots of therapies. We can explore their immune system. We'll, we, it's easy to do functional testing of the immune system to know uh, what is happening. It's very different in adults because, uh, in adults because yeah. they will have lots of other diseases, lots of other therapies. And that's happening in our diabetes cohorts. In our diabetes cohorts, we have we are struggling with them um, proving the the variants that we find, and in some we found variants that have tailored therapies, but the only manifestation is type one diabetes. So we have to be completely sure that that is the cause of the disease. So a word of caution: a whole exome or NGS, yes, but do know how to deal with the data. Yes. In adults, I'm absolutely against. We don't have to do in every patient, of course. We have to, to, to do something in patients that are out of our typical phenotype or don't answer to the, the things that we usually use and, and go well. When the state of care of many of these diseases are very good, so the patients are going to do okay, but sometimes we have different things. In different things, I think we have to, do, to go to genetics and to antibodies and antiseptics also. That is another problem uh, that we have to see. And, uh, but to the patients that we don't really have an answer and they have different phenotypes and difficult to treat patients, if we put patients, the standard of care patients that are doing okay, you are going to find a lot a lot of mutations without explanation, yes. and it's lost of money. You don't do anything with that. Secondary immunodeficiencies are much more frequent. Yeah, and I would also like to corroborate what Juan told us because we have the same experience, and it's really diff difficult even with the, our multidisciplinary team with immunology and genetics. Uh, sometimes we really don't know how to interpret some variants of unknown significance. And uh, it's really complicated how we tell the, the people, the parents, the, the child, and uh, should we uh, go to therapy if we are not completely convinced of the diagnosis? Laurent Ben, you want to? We have a, a question. Yes, thank you very much, both of you, for, for the talks. This is a very difficult field. I have a very practical question, which I think is more for Antonio, uh, based on a very common situation. Uh, we are all following patients with autoimmune diseases. Often it's new patients, but of course we are reference center. You are, we are reference center. And occasionally we see patients that have already seen many doctors that have been treated. So they arrive with an autoimmune disease, with lymphopenia, with hypogamma globulinemia. And my question is, how do you make the distinction between uh, secondary and primary immune deficiency in these patients? Terrible question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <most> terrible. <laughs> uh, one of the first things that we have to see is, is a practical issue if the patient needs absolutely gamma globulins. And one of the questions is the patient has clinical features of infections uh, even 
low-grade infections. Like I said, for example, patients who have 350, 400 grams per liter of, uh, four grams per liter of gamma globulins have a lot of immunosuppressive therapies, but are having infections or with capsulate diseases with, even without the without uh, immunosuppressive therapies, or they have a lot of bronchorrhea, for example, chronic bronchitis, already have bronchiectasis. These patients, despite they have primary or secondary, they need gamma globulins. Okay? And I think this is the first, uh, is a practical issue that we have to, to see in, first, in the first place. The second place, of course, we have to try to diagnose it where, where it starts the problem. Sometimes when we make a, 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 def, a trial of vaccination, we can find a specific antibody disease, uh, but even in secondary immunodeficiency, that can happen. Okay. So sometimes if the patient is really a, a, an hypogamma globulinemia patient that don't, we don't rescue itself from the, the therapies, Maybe we go for a West for to find a genetic, but um, we still have to keep them on gamma globulins. Even the patients, we, we have the, uh, an idea that uh, the patients who have low IgG because of B cell depletion of a lot of steroids, of a lot of immunosuppressive therapy, we keep them out of these therapies that they are going to recover. And that's why we are going to make the distinction. But even that cannot happen, may not happen. So we have to have a practical issue. The first practical issue is you have to say if the patient needs or not gamma globulins. That is the most important thing. And secondly, if we have features that can leave us to a primary immunodeficiency, okay, go to genetics and to a specific one like CBID, I think it will be good because sometimes we have teletherapies, for example, if the patient has enteropathy, that is not explained by the disease and by the different features. Maybe he has CBID. If you have a granulomatose, different granulomatose that we are used to, to see, maybe we need to have the, to check that. But these are more specific phenotypes. But uh, just to add one, uh, two things. The first, I think we have a, a uh, pharma pressure, a very, very high pharma pressure to start IVIG uh, in secondary immunodeficiencies. I think that's um, what happened in the last two or three years with pressure of pharma. Uh, I'm not completely convinced that uh, all hypogammaglobulinemia patients, secondary hypogammaglobulinemia has to be uh, substituted. We have to choose patients very carefully. We have to have gui guidelines and we have to uh, do everything by the book. Uh, with these patients. I think that the, the next two or three years, lots of guidelines will be needed to help you through, to help us through that decision. Yes. Um, in the, this year's ESID meeting was about secondary immunodeficiencies. And uh, there were some very interesting data, for example, patients on rituximab that have persistent uh, B cell lymphopenia, meaning uh, uh, lymphopenia, B cell lymphopenia that lasts more than six months after stopping rituximab, more or less uh, well, 25% of them have genetic defects uh, in B cell differentiation. And that's uh, a very novel uh, understanding of, uh, of this. Yes. That, uh, and we found that in lupus, not in rheumatoid arthritis, for example. Yes. Um, I think Antonio mentioned that uh, the French group showed that you have uh, antibodies against uh, interferon alpha in, uh, in patients with COVID. Interestingly, and particularly the ones with uh, air deficiency, monogenic deficiency and polyglandular syndrome, they, they have these antibodies. But now we are also discussing that we are treating uh, patients with a humoral immunodeficiency for the IVIG. Should we now start to check for the presence of these antibodies? because we make them more prone to have uh, severe COVID uh, problems. That, that's, uh, sorry, <laughs> just two of us running. No. Uh, I absolutely agree. And that is a point. That is why, that is the explanation why patients on um, plasma exchange, that were some trials in the beginning, 
that with plasma exchange um, in the COVID severe patients, they died more than the others and the, the trial was stopped. And that was, and the French group showed that was because in the plasma, they had lots of antitrifurin alpha antibodies. And that is true. The only group of PIDs that suffers more than COVID and the others is APSAD with their mutations because they have anti-interferon anti alpha antibodies. I don't think that's a problem at the moment because the, our IVIG doesn't have a lot of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, anti-interferon alpha antibodies, apparently. They, this has been checked in, by some groups and uh, apparently it's not in levels that interfere with, uh, with response, but I absolutely agree that it's a very good question and uh, we have to be careful, yes. We can have uh, one of the answers is why wh how the, the the way we are treating uh, severe COVID patients and uh, this is basic science to understand uh, to understand physiology, but uh, maybe we cannot uh, use that on clinical practice, but maybe it gives an idea why anti L six or anti jacking or jacking inhibition can uh, be a, a therapy for most severe COVID patients. Uh, I see this is a kind of tailored therapy. And now the, the World Organization is giving, is telling that, us that we should, on severe patients, we could go on docilizumab. And some patients in Spain have used baricitinib and other drugs, uh, the blocks also, the, the JAK inhibition, the, the, the JAK inhibitors. And I, I I agree that is possible the way they are they are dealing with that. I don't know in clinical practice how we can deal with the anti-interferon. I would not go to anti-interferon uh, antibodies for clinical practice at this moment. Okay, but it's very important to have blood of these patients and to have serotype of these patients to improve our knowledge. Uh, that's why we can have new drugs. <laughs> It's been a really interesting discussion, but uh, I think it's time for lunch. So uh, this uh, session is closed. Thank you. Não, 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 não.
Posso apagar? 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 Posso Thank uh-huh. you. 